It was a cold November, 2013. My name is Milton, and I was sitting in my modest cabin buried deep within the Appalachian Mountains, chuckling over a cheesy joke I heard earlier that day. As an outdoorsman, it was no surprise when my friends suggested we explore the mountain's beautiful foliage and breathtaking landscapes. We were oblivious to any danger that could be lurking in these beautiful surroundings. Our group consisted of myself, Cecilia, and Damon, three old friends who loved adventure and being out in nature. We chose a remote area in the Appalachian Mountains for our getaway one which seemed perfect for relaxation, hiking, and fellowshipping by the campfire. During our hike on the first day, Cecilia noticed strange markings on a few trees near our campsite. Each tree had parallel claw marks etched deep into its bark. Maybe they were caused by a bundle of pine needles rubbing up against them, Cecilia offered cautiously. They're far too precise for something like that. Damon interjected as his gaze remained fixated on the claw marks. I agreed with Damon but decided not to dwell on it too much. We didn't want to spoil our trip because of some mysterious scratch marks. And so we went on with our journey in blissful ignorance. As we continued through majestic landscapes filled with vibrant colors of yellows, reds and oranges contrasting against the bleak sky above us, there came a point where we stumbled upon what appeared to be an abandoned shack. The weathered wood planks barely clung together while its shingles hung by mere threads. Curiosity took hold of us, so we decided to poke around inside this relic from a forgotten time. As soon as I swung open the rotting door, we were hit with an overwhelming stench that nearly knocked us off our feet. Bellows of, What is that smell? erupted between dry heaves. None of us had ever encountered such a nauseating odor. Through our watering eyes, we noticed that the rancid smell was coming from something wrapped in a decaying tarp. With shaky hands, Damon decided to lift a corner of the tarp despite Cecilia's protests. Beneath it, we found the remains of a severely mutilated animal. I've seen my fair share of dead animals, but this was nothing like I had ever come across, muscles torn apart from their bones and limbs twisted around at unnatural angles. Just when we thought we couldn't take any more, a heavy thud boomed across the wooded landscape behind us. What was that? Cecilia cried out as her voice trembled with fear. Before any of us could answer, another loud crash came from deeper within the woods. It felt like something was approaching our area. As we stared dumbfounded at the tree line, we saw the terrifying figure for the first time, a monstrous creature moving on all four legs. Its long limbs ended in razor-sharp claws, and its matted fur appeared to have patches missing from it. It had hauntingly ferocious eyes, which were set on us. Paralyzed with fear, Damon managed to stutter out his thoughts. This thing is responsible for the mutilated carcass in there. We realized there was no hope in staying where we were if the creature had marked this area as its territory. Our minds raced with adrenaline as our heartbeats quickened. We had to leave immediately. We quickly gathered our belongings and headed for an open clearing where we felt less exposed. As we huddled together beneath thick oak branches lashing wildly above us due to near-gale force winds now battering against us, panic began to take hold. All right, I said, trying to keep my voice from shaking as well. Wind is spotty out here so calling for help is our best bet. Unforeseen old Appalachian Mountains. I nervously chuckled as I tried to ease our collective anxiety with a lousy joke. We ran through the woods, our hearts pounding in unison. The creature pursued us with relentless determination, crashing through the undergrowth and gaining on us rapidly. Still, 
we pressed forward, unable to slow down for fear that it would catch up. Suddenly, a small cabin appeared ahead of us, its windows illuminated by a faint light inside. In our panic-stricken state, it was a beacon of hope that might offer us some refuge. We raced toward the cabin and burst through the door, locking it behind us. Cecilia and Damon immediately began frantically searching for a way to communicate with anyone who could help. Unfortunately, there didn't seem to be any phone lines or internet connections. By this point, even an old-fashioned landline would have sufficed. We didn't know why we couldn't call for help. Perhaps it was due to our remote location in the Appalachian Mountains, or maybe, somehow, this creature had interfered with any possible communication. Our desperation grew along with our fear. The creature was outside the window now, its grotesque eyes watching us from within a veil of darkness. It didn't attack right away but was content to observe our panic as we desperately tried to figure out what to do next. In between crashing sounds from outside came the distant murmur of flowing water, a possible answer to our despair. With the realization that there was a nearby river that might provide an escape route, or at least slow down the creature's pursuit, we decided we needed to leave the cabin immediately. It took all of our courage just for one brave step into the night, but together we ran towards the sound of running water in a final desperate attempt for salvation. Our wild run led us to a steep, rocky incline above the roaring river below. With nowhere else to turn, we all held hands tightly and leapt into the turbulent waters. The cold water enveloped us as we plunged into the river. We struggled with all our might not to be consumed by the powerful current, and instead pushed our way towards the opposite bank. As we climbed out of the water, we noticed the creature had not followed us. Perhaps its long limbs and twisted body prevented it from swimming, or perhaps it was wary of a river that seemed to have been our savior. We gathered ourselves, soaked and exhausted, on the other side of the river for just a moment to catch our breath. Then, we set off again through the dark woods, determined to put as much distance between ourselves and that creature as possible. Over the next few days, we kept moving, frequently looking over our shoulders to make sure it wasn't following us. Sleep was scarce as each snapping twig or rustling leaf had us convinced that the creature was back for more. Relief finally came when we stumbled upon a rural road that led us out of the dense forest and back into civilization. Without a doubt, those harrowing days were what brought Cecilia, Damon, and me closer together than we'd ever imagined possible. Our fight for survival against the seemingly unstoppable foes strengthened our bonds for life bonds that even now continue to persist. In time... We spoke less often about those terrifying days in the woods. Some things were too horrific to dwell on, and memory had a way of dulling the visceral impact of horrifying events like these. But occasionally, when we found ourselves together by chance or design on a dark night with shadows looming, we couldn't help but glance over our shoulders one last time just in case and through it all remains an unspoken pledge shared among Cecilia, Damon, and me. Never again would any one of us venture into those dark woods to confront whatever evil it was that tore into prey with such brutal abandon. For while we may have escaped its clutches once before battered and scared though we were one thing was certain, we would not be so lucky a second time around. In March 2006, my friends and I took a hiking trip deep into the Appalachian Mountains. I am Jack Holloway, an accountant from the suburbs, delving into the great outdoors to find some sense of adventure. My companions included Cecil Marlsberg, 
an unassuming electrician with a dry wit. Leone Gleason, a small-town teacher with a passion for photography, and Samuel Nesbitt, a graphic designer with striking tattoos and piercings. Our group clicked instantly. We shared stories about our passions over our first campfire together. As the nights grew colder and darker during our trek up the mountain range, we stumbled upon an isolated glen nestled between steep ridges. We knew nothing about the place, but decided it was perfect for our home base for the remainder of this journey. One night while we sat by a fire consuming dehydrated chicken and potatoes as one of Leone's puns caused raucous laughter, we noticed that the usual sounds of crickets, birds, and insects had vanished. It was as if nature herself held her breath. What do you guess? The bugs fed up with Leone's jokes too, jested Cecil. We exchanged uneasy glances before brushing off the strangeness as part of being in an unfamiliar place. The next morning, Samuel discovered muddied animal tracks nearby our campsite, elongated footprints with claw marks that didn't resemble those of any animals we were familiar with. I cautiously suggested that maybe it was some kind of local wildlife that we didn't know about. Days of increasingly repetitive hiking through foggy valleys took its toll on us. Moral support transformed into gallows humor as one particularly horrible afternoon found us soaked to the bone from unexpected rain. Frustration hitched my voice higher as I snapped. Maybe we should have followed those peculiar footprints instead. Cecil lightened up the mood with his humor, remarking, Remember Jack's law. Don't chase after strange things that could kill you. Sounds like a solid rule to me. That night, we were huddled around yet another fire trying to dry ourselves when we heard a twig snap. Our eyes shot towards the direction of the sound, but saw nothing. Leone swallowed hard then tried to reassure us. It's probably just an animal passing by. We continued to explore the unknown tracks with weary eyes during our hikes for a few days until one morning, things took a turn for the worse. During a solo hike along an abandoned trailhead, I came across a campsite that had been torn apart, ripped tents, smashed camping gear and deep claw marks in the trunks of surrounding trees. It appeared as if something had waged war on this encampment with horrifying efficiency and fury. I rushed back to share my findings with my friends. Together we inspected the decimated campsite. Cecil muttered, This place looked like it was shredded by some gigantic creature. We exchanged tense nods and agreed to keep our camp better protected and maintained a buddy system from there on out. Days later the rain came again, heavier this time. As we all huddled beneath our flimsy tent walls listening to Samuel's rain dance theory about attracting storms only when you're unprepared far from civilization we found ourselves restless again. Shaken by my disturbing discoveries, I struggled to sleep that night. But eventually exhaustion took over, and I drifted off. Sometime during that dark hour between midnight and dawn, I was jolted awake by the piercing sound of a woman screaming. My heart raced as I stumbled out of my tent, only to find Leone standing there pointing at something I could hardly fathom, a terrifying creature towering over eight feet in height covered in matted fur with long sinewy limbs that ended in gnarled claws. It, it was standing there, watching. Leone sputtered in a panic, her eyes wide with fear. As I stared at the night-shrouded apparition, my already heavy heart somehow got heavier as I realized humanity's world was far more terrifying than we ever dared to suspect. We couldn't believe our eyes, but the evidence was right in front of us. The creature was real, and it was threatening our lives. We knew we had to call for help 
but our remote location made it difficult to get any signal on our phones. Our only option was to find the nearest town and seek assistance. We packed up our camp as quickly as possible and began our desperate trek towards civilization. With each step, we couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was following us, stalking us like prey. At one point, Samuel tripped over a large rock and injured his ankle while Cecil carried him the rest of the way. When we finally reached a small town, we went straight to the police station. They listened to our story but were skeptical of the terrifying creature we described. It had long arms, powerful legs, and massive claws capable of tearing through flesh with ease. Its eyes seemed to glow in the darkness, instilling an inexplicable fear in everyone who gazed upon it. Despite their skepticism, they agreed to send an officer back with us to investigate the destroyed campsite and gather any evidence of the creature's existence. As we led them to the location, we kept a vigilant eye out for any signs of the creature's return. Upon arriving at the campsite with the officer, we found it just as we had left it torn apart and frighteningly silent. The officer carefully examined the claw marks on trees and appeared genuinely concerned about what he saw. This is unlike anything I've ever seen, he said, taking photos of what remained of our campsite. He contacted his superiors and requested backup while also warning us not to venture too far from town until they could determine what exactly we were dealing with. Four days, we stayed in a tiny motel in town as more officers arrived along with experts from a nearby university specializing in wildlife research. They scoured the forest for the creature that had so brutally attacked our campsite but found no signs of it. When they interviewed us, they asked numerous questions about the creature's appearance and behavior. They seemed especially interested in what it had done after Leone spotted it. Was it eating? No. Was it protecting something? We didn't know. Their curiosity only added to our confusion and anxiety. A week later, they held a town meeting where they explained their findings. As it turned out, the claw marks on the trees closely resembled those of a known species of bear known for its aggressive behavior when threatened. Their theory was that the creature we saw was simply an unusually large and territorial bear. Though this explanation didn't fully align with what we saw or experienced, we couldn't argue against it with any concrete evidence of our own. It was easier to accept their conclusion than to continue searching for answers to a mystery we may never solve. We returned home heavy-hearted, each of us mourning the loss of the idyllic adventure we had imagined when planning our camping trip. As we said goodbye to each other, there was an unspoken understanding that none of us could ever forget what had happened during that fateful trip. Years have passed since that terrifying encounter in the forest, but our memories of those harrowing days are as fresh as ever. Though there were no casualties amongst us, we all carry reminders with us of those bone-chilling moments staring into the eyes of an unknown creature that should never have existed in our world. And sometimes, on dark nights when shadows seem darker than usual and fear grips tight, I can't help but wonder if that massive, sinister creature is still out there stalking through the forest, biding its time until its next encounter with unsuspecting campers in a remote corner of the woods. After a particularly intense month at work, I decided to take a much-needed break in the Appalachian Mountains. It was October 2009, and the multicolored foliage was in full bloom. The trip was a solo experience, an opportunity to escape the daily grind and reconnect with nature. I chose an isolated spot in the mountains, just outside of Roanoke, Virginia. 
perfect for quiet contemplation and exploration. The place had a quaint little cabin with basic amenities and cozy interiors. It was nothing fancy, but it suited me just fine. Being on my own wasn't an issue for me. I enjoyed my solitude. The first few days were blissful. Walks through dense woodland, peaceful afternoons by the creek, and evenings by the fire. One evening as I strolled back towards the cabin after watching leaves fall from the trees, I stumbled upon an odd scene. Amongst the foliage lay a destroyed campsite. Tents were shredded as if they had been ripped apart by incredibly powerful claws. Camping equipment lay scattered everywhere, and smears of blood decorated the torn fabric of the tents. Hey! Anyone here? I yelled out tentatively. No response. The rational part of my brain wanted to assume that it was a bear or some other known wildlife that had attacked this site. But something didn't sit right with me. The level of destruction seemed too immense for any ordinary animal. With dusk approaching fast, my priority was to make it back to my cabin quickly before nightfall arrived. Those unsettling images stayed with me well into dinner but were soon washed away after a swig or two from my flask. On day four of my trip, I heard my neighbor's dog barking wildly in the distance. Miles, an old-timer living half a mile from my cabin had mentioned him when we crossed paths earlier that week. He's gentle, he had said about his canine companion. He's been with me for ten years now and has never had an issue with anything. He loves all creatures, even the ones he should be afraid of. Initially, I dismissed the barking. However, as it continued to persist throughout the day, my curiosity got the better of me. Deciding to explore further, I took a walk in the direction of the barking. The moment I approached Miles' property, my heart sank. There was his beloved dog, its lifeless and mauled body displayed before me in a grotesque display unlike anything I'd ever seen. My hands trembled as I shouted for Miles, but again, no response. It seemed as though whatever horrific creature was responsible had vanished into thin air. Shaken by this sight, I returned to my cabin and double-checked every lock and window. As night fell, I lay on my bed with ears perked up to any ominous sound, trying to ignore what appeared to be a muffled thud by the front door. Rationalizing that it must be a raccoon or some other critter outside, something finally compelled me to investigate further. Safety in mind, I grabbed my trusty flashlight along with my hunting knife opening the door cautiously. A gory sight awaited me. An oversized wolf stood less than ten feet away from where I stood. Its black eyes appeared almost human-like in their depth and seemed as though they were studying me with sinister curiosity. But what struck me most were its limbs, sharply elongated and twisted at unnatural angles. This was no ordinary creature. I could barely stifle a scream but managed to plaster myself against the cabin wall without engaging further with this monstrous being that looked at me like prey ready for consumption. The oversized wolf stared at me intently, and I knew I had to act fast. Fear gripping my breath, I slammed and locked the door behind me. The creature let out an enraged howl as it lunged towards the door clawing fervently at the wood. Reality hit me hard. There would be no time to call for help. The nearest neighbor was miles away, and I was left with a dead phone line. My instincts told me this was a battle of survival, one which I had never been prepared for. But what options did I have? As the howls outside reached an almost demonic pitch, I started barricading the door using whatever furniture I could find chairs, a small dresser, even a dining table. Every step of that adrenaline-fueled process, 
My mind was racing to figure out what had brought such a nightmarish being into my life. After what felt like an eternity but was only a matter of minutes, my makeshift barricade stood between me and the relentless predator outside my cabin. Unsure whether this barrier would hold, I knew it was essential to remain alert and not let my guard down. Throughout the long night, the wolf's growls remained muffled and distant. On occasion, those vicious sounds grew louder as if it were testing its luck in breaching my defenses a test that went on for hours before finally dying down with the rise of morning sun rays. As daylight streamed into my cabin, I dared to hold my breath and gently peek through the curtains scanning the vicinity for any signs of that monstrous being. There were clear claw marks on the snarled-up ground outside my door, but no trace of its presence remained. With newfound courage found in daylight hours, I ventured out of my refuge and made haste toward Miles' property who desperately needed help. With a heavy heart knowing his loyal companion was no more, concern shifted towards his well-being. The faster I reached him, the better. Upon reaching Miles' place, I found him lying unconscious on the floor with wounds that seemed consistent with the mauling of his late canine friend. Inspecting him thoroughly, I concluded that he was somehow still alive, albeit barely. Without wasting another second, we both fled for safety, seeking urgent medical attention and assistance from local law enforcement. As we attempted to explain the nightmarish event in gripping detail, the authorities appeared as bewildered as we were. Nonetheless, they assembled a team to investigate my cabin and its surroundings. Miles, after regaining consciousness and receiving proper care at a local clinic, decided it was best to leave the area for good, a decision I would soon follow with unwavering conviction. The investigation led to no conclusions and left local enforcement scratching their heads. Questions remained unanswered. What was this creature? Did it have a purpose? Or was it merely a terror born from nature's terrifying manifestations? We never heard from each other again after parting ways. Our past littered with memories of that harrowing ordeal and losses suffered, life taking on new directions with hopes of moving on entirely from that nightmare. The encounter with the wolf-like beast became a story shared throughout town, whispered as quietly as a brewing storm warning of impending tragedies. A story that would never leave my thoughts and shadow every step I took, an unavoidable price paid for having survived such a chilling experience and lost friends within its cruel grasp. For there are stories born from reality's darkest corners ones best forgotten yet impossible to dismiss entirely in our existence's course. In October 2011, I found myself signing up for an intensive weekend wilderness survival course in the remote part of the Appalachian Mountains. As a person who graduated from university with high scores, I often craved challenges. However, nothing prepared me for what lay ahead. A group of six people, including our instructor Mike, arrived at the campsite late in the afternoon. As we bonded over setting up tents and cooking dinner, our diverse backgrounds and experiences made for interesting conversations. As Mike led us through a series of emergency scenarios and survival skills the next day, I couldn't help but feel a sense of exhilaration in my newfound abilities. While we were hiking that Sunday morning, Mike motioned us to stop and called our attention to a strange-looking tree. The trunk was partially stripped of its bark, and deep scratches covered the exposed wood. Probably just a bear, Mike remarked casually. Alex, a stockbroker from New York City, studied the damage cautiously. 
but why would a bear scratch so uniformly like that? He wondered aloud before shaking his head in confusion. Unsettled yet intrigued by Alec's comment, we continued on deeper into the forest. That night, as we gathered around the campfire telling stories, the wind howled eerily through the trees. The firelight flickered across each person's face as their unique tales stirred unsettling emotions within me. Suddenly, we heard cracking branches from somewhere in the darkness surrounding us. Our laughter ceased at once. Mike switched off his flashlight to assess the situation better. A cold sweat beaded on my forehead as whatever was out there moved closer. Trying to muffle our breathing sounds to avoid detection proved futile when Haley, a young nurse, uncontrollably gasped in terror. We waited with bated breath for whatever was lurking in the darkness to reveal itself. Moments later, it appeared, about twenty yards away from our campsite. A grotesque, partially humanoid creature stood hunched on all fours, its body covered in matted fur. Its deep-set yellow eyes pierced the darkness, and razor-sharp teeth protruded menacingly from a distorted snout. Mike scrambled for his rifle and shouted, Stay back! I got this! His trembling hands as he attempted to load a bullet made the situation all the more terrifying. I thought of my family back home and whispered a silent prayer before stealing myself for the inevitable showdown. Why hadn't we called for help? It was a combination of pride and stubbornness since we wanted to prove we could survive anything. All of us instinctively backed up a few steps as the creature snarled and let out an abnormally high-pitched scream that pierced through the air. With barely any time to react, I sprinted after Mike but stumbled over a log in my path. I quickly glanced over my shoulder. The creature was no more than ten feet away, rapidly closing in on me. In my panic I yelled out, Help! Somebody please help me! I wasn't sure if anyone else would hear me through their own terror, but there was no other option. The creature lunged at me, but at the last moment, Mike fired his rifle. The gunshot rang through the air and the creature stumbled to the side, obviously wounded. It let out an agonizing scream before turning to look at Mike with a deep hatred in its eyes. Realizing we now had a chance to escape or potentially bring this creature down, I grabbed a nearby branch and prepared to defend myself as well. Everyone, run back to camp! Go! shouted Mike firing another shot at the monstrous being. The others hesitated for just a moment before taking off in the direction of our campsite. As I watched them leave hoping they could call for help, I realized my phone was back at camp. We left our phones at the campsite and decided against bringing them deeper into the forest. The regret of that decision weighed heavily on me as I desperately wished to call for assistance in this horrifying situation. Mike continued firing at the creature as it staggered back with each gunshot wound. Drawing closer to him and wanting to help any way possible, I swung my makeshift weapon, that heavy branch picked from the ground moments ago. Surprisingly, it connected with the creature's head with a resounding crack. Dazed and injured severely by the combination of gunshots and my attack defense efforts, he stumbled away from us and disappeared into the forest's darkness once more. Mike and I wasted no time in racing back towards our campsite. Picking up our phones and making urgent calls for help even though we knew it might not be wise no one in their right mind would believe such a story. We struggled to describe what had just happened without sounding completely insane, but were finally able to convince authorities to come to our location. They sent a search and rescue team, armed officers, and even some wildlife experts. While waiting for their arrival, we found the others hiding in various spots throughout our campsite, 
all of them trembling in fear and traumatized by the events that unfolded. When the rescue teams approached, we could see the doubt written on their faces they were likely wondering if this would turn out to be a wild goose chase. Searching for any signs of the creature we had encountered proved useless. The only evidence left behind was a trail of blood from where it was injured during our skirmish. It seemed as if whatever it was had managed to drag itself away, perhaps even back into the deeper parts of the forest where it could hide and recuperate. As we finally made our way back from that terrifying place, we tried to make sense of everything we had experienced. We could only speculate on what that creature was and why it had attacked us. Even after receiving support from the authorities, we could see in their eyes that they didn't believe our story fully. Maybe they thought this was all an elaborate prank or a case of mass hysteria. It wasn't long before we discovered that one of our group members, Haley, never made it back to the campsite during the chaos. A search was conducted for several days, but, unfortunately, to no avail. Left with no other choice but to accept this harsh reality and move on with a heavy heart. Looking back on those haunting events, there's not a day when I don't think about what happened in that forest and wonder if we could have done anything differently. I still lucidly remember each detail, from Alex's comment before entering the forest to Mike's actions and my frantic attempts at survival. We lost Haley that night to an unidentifiable creature, and while sometimes doubt tries to invite itself into my thoughts along with countless questions that may never be answered, I know deep within me that what transpired was beyond comprehension. Time passed, and we each took our separate paths, trying to mend those wounds left behind and though we rarely talk about our encounter anymore, it's clear that the memories remain branded in our minds. April 2015 I remember it was the month of my 29th birthday when my buddies and I decided to take a break from our ordinary lives and go on a hiking trip in the Appalachian Mountains. As an accountant by profession, I needed this getaway from the office-filled reality. We chose Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia as our destination. My friends on this trip were Casper Wainwright, Veronica Whipple, and Herbert O'Malley. Casper, a software engineer, was the brains of our group. Veronica, a history teacher passionate about Appalachian history, knew quite a bit about the place. And Herbert, a large man with barely controllable energy, had survival skills that were handy to have around. On our first day there, we were setting up camp near a serene creek when Veronica started sharing some peculiar legends connected to those mountains. She spoke about the numerous coal mining disasters that took place here years ago. Still, we laughed them off as bedtime stories meant to scare kids away from wandering too far. The following morning we embarked on our hike into the heart of this vast wilderness. The trail was beautiful but arduous at times. As we hiked further into the forest, we noticed the increasingly thick fog enveloping us. Visibility was reduced dramatically. Casper turned his head and yelled over the distant rumble of a waterfall ahead. Hey guys, let's check out that waterfall. Maybe get some sweet photos for Instagram. We agreed and began making our way towards the sound of cascading water when Veronica let out a blood-curdling scream. John! Look! I froze as I gazed upon something my mind struggled to process. Human bones mangled together and scattered around a makeshift fire pit, an eerie ambience emanating from the horrendous sight. This can't be real. Herbert quivered beside me while looking at his friend's pale faces. Despite our shock, 
We decided to push onward to find the waterfall partly because of a morbid curiosity, but also as a logical explanation for the appalling sight we just witnessed. With our hearts pounding from the ordeal, we reached the waterfall only to find something even more horrifying. Chained to a tree was what seemed to be a man, whose flesh had been shredded, exposing the bright white bones underneath. Veronica knelt beside him, checking for any signs of life and shook her head. Folks, I think we stumbled upon a crime scene. I stuttered. We need to find help. As we scoured the area by the waterfall, Casper discovered an abandoned and dilapidated mine entrance. Upon closer inspection, we found mangled mining equipment partially concealed beneath decades-old dirt and foliage. These were remnants of an old coal mine long left derelict. The unusual and terrifying discoveries made us feel like tiny pawns in a twisted game of cat and mouse. However, both Veronica and Herbert convinced us that we should make our way back to camp before nightfall and plan our next move. At camp that night, every little rustle or snap in the woods sent chills shooting up our spines. A sense of impending doom loomed over us as if we were being watched from the shadows by someone or something. Casper nervously joked around while trying, unsuccessfully, to eat his well-expired instant soup. Hey guys, at least our lives are far from ordinary now. Our laughter was short-lived when suddenly Veronica gagged on her food. Lodged in her meal was a decaying human tooth with bloodied roots jutting out in all directions. That's it, I declared. Tomorrow morning, we're packing up and calling the authorities from town. That night felt endless as none of us could sleep due to dread saturating every moment. As we began packing up at the break of dawn, we were greeted by an ominous spectacle. A grotesque creature on all fours with the carcass of a deer dangling from its jaw emerged from the brush. Its elongated arms bore twisted claws, and its mouth appeared to stretch unnaturally wide to fit around the deer's fractured vertebrae. Just when it seemed as if it would retreat into the wilderness, the creature set its bloodshot eyes on us, unleashed an ungodly snarl, and lunged in our direction. Casper panicked and grabbed a fire poker and charged towards the terrifying beast. Casper courageously charged toward the creature. But suddenly, out of logic and fear, we all screamed in unison. Casper, no! Get back here! Heeding our warning, Casper stopped in his tracks as the monstrous creature lunged towards him. He narrowly dodged its razor-sharp claw swipe. This gave me just enough time to grab Veronica and Herbert and start running for our lives. As we raced through the forest, the creature relentlessly pursued us. We heard the cracking of branches and guttural growls, which only fueled our terror. We reached a clearing with an old abandoned wooden house that seemed like suitable temporary shelter. Hoping it would buy us some time to consider our next steps, we all dashed inside and barricaded the door with whatever furniture we could find. The creature's roars grew more distant, and I convinced myself that we'd successfully thrown it off our trail. After catching our breaths from the adrenaline rush, we realized that we couldn't stay in the house forever. We had limited food and water. Our situation was dire. Why didn't we call for help or contact the authorities? Veronica lamented between heavy breaths. We were foolish thinking this was just some abandoned coal mine, motioned Herbert in sudden realization. And now it's too late, with that thing chasing us constantly. We held ourselves together despite our regret. As darkness enveloped us once again, the creature started circling the house and scratching menacingly at the wooden walls. Running seemed impossible, 
Calling for help was out of the question without any means of communication so deep in the woods. In an unexpected show of determination to survive yet another night, Casper devised the plan, lured the creature away from the house long enough to escape toward town for help. Don't worry about me, Casper said when he saw our hesitations. We need help now. Despite our objections, he was already resolute in his decision. We only hope the gods speed to him. Casper, carrying a torch, burst out of the house and began yelling at the monster. The creature engrossed in its prey chase pursued Casper through the dark wilderness. When the creature followed Casper into the woods, we wasted no time and sprinted towards the town. After hours of running until our lungs burned, we finally arrived, gasping for air and drenched in sweat. Upon reaching civilization, we informed the authorities about our horrifying experience with a detailed account of everything, from our campsite by the waterfall to what we assumed was an old mine. A search and rescue team were dispatched immediately equipped with tranquilizer darts to subdue the creature if found. Hours passed by as we anxiously awaited their return. It felt like centuries. Finally, they arrived back in town with more than we could have hoped for, Casper. He was battered and bruised but still alive, miraculously managing to elude and tire out the creature long enough for rescuers to find them both. Now that everyone was safe and accounted for, there was a collective sigh of relief around us. Our terrifying adventure had come to an end. Understandably, no one ever dared venture back into those woods after that ill-fated camping trip. Our story would serve as a gruesome reminder of what lurked within those shadows. The old mind would remain undisturbed and off-limits for future adventurers. Some horrors are best left unexplored. Despite Casper's heroism during that encounter, None of us will ever forget those shocking moments or Veronica's morbid discovery that had altered our lives forever. The indelible memories of bloodshot eyes and razor-sharp claws are etched in our minds, a haunting reminder of how close death had grazed us not too many days ago. June 2019, I found myself taking a solo trip to the Appalachian Mountains, an adventure I never thought I'd embark on. My name is Alec Faraday. I am a web developer from Santa Cruz, California. Nature has always been my escape from the stress and busyness of city life. I had arrived at Glen Falls in North Carolina late in the afternoon on a Friday. As a proud food connoisseur, I couldn't help but stop at every farm stand and general store along the way to sample some delicious fresh produce grown by the locals. After setting up my small tent at the nearby campsite, I decided to take a walk deeper into the Appalachians to appreciate its beauty. As I walked through the dense forest, taking in the smell of pines and listening to the sound of rustling leaves, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin situated in a clearing. Typically, abandoned cabins would have my mind racing to thoughts of angry squatters or wildlife nesting within. However, curiosity got the better of me as I approached this fascinating relic. Hey! A raspy voice came from behind me just before I touched the doorknob. Startled but relieved it was another human being. I turned around to greet the source of the voice. Hi there, I returned cautiously. My name's Alec. I'm Daryl, he replied with a wary smile. You might not want to touch that. Townsfolk say this place might be cursed or something. I chuckled at his comment, trying to mask any small ounce of fear that threatened to surface. Oh, really? Cursed? His grin grew wider as he leaned in closer. Yep. 
They say some weird animal-like creature has been spotted lurking around these parts. My eyebrow raised skeptically as I tried to keep things lighthearted by laughing it off. Well then, thanks for the heads up, Daryl. I'll be sure to tread carefully. We chatted for a few moments before parting ways, and I continued my exploration of the forest, forgetting all about the eerie cabin and its rumored curse. As the evening rolled in and dusk began to blanket the landscape, I decided to call it a day. I headed back towards my campsite, but when I reached it, I noticed something distinctly unsettling. My entire camp had been destroyed not in a way that a human could have done it by simply knocking things over. The tent was shredded viciously, as though something with sharp claws had tried to dig through it. My heart raced. The thought of Daryl's story about the cursed cabin flashed into my mind. Despite my skepticism, I couldn't help but feel snared by an invisible web of panic as everything around me seemed silent. Suddenly remembering what Daryl said about this creature stalking around these parts, I realized that it might be lurking close by. I gathered my courage deciding whether to try fixing my destroyed camp or escape back to civilization. Remembering that I had zero functioning transportation since we were deep into the Appalachian Mountains, fixing the campsite seemed like my only choice. It was now nighttime, and by then, I had managed to piece together what was left of my tent. My senses were on high alert as I cautiously scanned my surroundings for any signs of the mysterious creature that tore apart my camp. In an attempt to lighten up the tense atmosphere, I rummaged through what remained of my supplies and discovered a small bag of marshmallows that had survived the chaos unharmed. Armed with sticks whittled from a fallen branch nearby and a flickering fire, anxiety slowly began to fade as I roasted marshmallows over open flames while letting out exhausted chuckles between mouthfuls. Suddenly, mid-bite, an unfamiliar growling sound echoed through the eerily still Appalachian night. A strange beast lunged out from the darkness, shrouded by shadows with its piercing red eyes locked on mine. With unbelievable speed, the creature closed the distance between us, revealing its grotesque features, elongated limbs, a wicked maw filled with razor-sharp teeth. In a surge of adrenaline, I tried to retreat, but the savage creature's gaze never wavered. It let out another guttural growl, its eyes narrowing and a predatory smirk forming on its lips. I knew I couldn't win against this monstrous assailant, and my only chance of survival was to flee. I turned on my heel and sprinted in the opposite direction. My heart pounded with each rapid step as I tried to put as much distance between myself and the creature as possible. I silently prayed that it wouldn't follow me, but unfortunately, my prayers went unanswered. Within moments, the creature pursued me relentlessly, each swift movement drawing it closer. It wasn't a cat or dog or anything remotely familiar. It was something else entirely. My fear intensified as I recognized there was no way for me to call for help. Only Daryl knew about our camping location deep within these mountains. My legs began to tire, but I continued running, unwilling to meet my grisly fate. The branches of nearby trees whipped against my face, pain surging through my body from their stinging impacts. However, this pain paled in comparison to what the creature would inflict if it caught up with me. Suddenly, a cliff came into view, a final obstacle seemingly impossible to overcome. I skidded to a stop on the edge of it and looked back at the approaching monster. Our eyes met again as we both stood at an impasse. Unsure of what else to do, I glanced at the sharp branches behind me and had an idea. Snatching one up like a makeshift weapon and gripping it tightly in trembling hands, 
I faced off against the unknown beast that wanted nothing more than to end me. As it lunged forward once more, all sense of reasoning vanished from its hate-filled eyes. Survival instincts kicked in. I desperately brandished my newfound weapon at it and thrust it towards the creature with all my force. The unexpected attack momentarily stunned the creature, and I seized the opportunity to sidestep it, tossing the branch to the side. With a newfound will to survive, I sprinted past the confused monstrous being and quickly put distance between us. I could hear the beast's furious snarl behind me as it realized its grim intentions had been thwarted. Nearing exhaustion, I stumbled upon a forest ranger station, a beacon of hope in the midst of doom. Bursting through the entrance, gasping for breath, I frantically explained my terrifying encounter to the rangers. They immediately recognized the urgency in my voice and sprang into action. For days afterward, search parties scoured the area investigating my claims about this unnatural assailant, yet regrettably found no evidence of the creature's existence. Soon enough, life returned to normal for me, appearances always misleading about how one could confront such a horrifying event. But as I moved on from that fateful night in the Appalachian Mountains, remembering those who'd encountered worse didn't go remiss. Every word they uttered rang true when forced to confront fear itself. Though I eventually returned to my regular life far away from that dark mountainside ravine, something changed within me after that encounter with such an awful amalgamation of malice. Be it animal or curse of Daryl's tale, one thing remained certain. Each day afterward acted as a reminder that there would always be terrifying unknown and elusive dangers lurking at each corner. It was the summer of 2016 and I had decided to take a break from my hectic city life to spend some time hiking in the serene Appalachian Mountains with a group of friends. My name is Leopold Bromwell, but my friends call me Leo. We all gathered at an obscure location near the little-known town of Keeling, Virginia. As we trekked through the forest, we shared various anecdotes and cracked light-hearted jokes that made us burst into laughter. Guys, I said, trying to catch my breath. Did you hear about the three-legged dog that walked into a bar and said, I'm looking for the man who shot my paw? Get it? The group collectively groaned at the terrible pun. On our third day in the wilderness, as we took a break near a creek, something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye an unnervingly large animal footprint near the edge of the water. It appeared slightly distorted and possessed an elusive quality that both allured and repulsed me. I called to my friend Marius Donafort to come have a look. Leo, are you serious? Marius said. Quit pulling our legs. We have miles to cover today. No, really. I insisted firmly as I pointed at the mysterious print with determination. Marius examined it for a moment before saying with nervous chuckle, Weird print? Must be Bigfoot or something. Let's keep hiking. As we continued on our journey through the picturesque Appalachian landscape, an eerie feeling began to settle over us when we realized that huge prints seemed to follow us no matter how deep into the woods we ventured. Even though we remained light-hearted and tried not to think too much into it like retelling stories of crazy things in college, we couldn't shake off that feeling of dread. By dusk as we pitched tents near a rocky area, the atmosphere was thick with tension. We huddled around the campfire, still determined to enjoy a casual game of cards against humanity in an attempt to forget our unease. After a few more jokes and hearty laughter, we finally resigned to get some sleep. I was in that nebulous state between consciousness 
and sleep when I suddenly felt the ground beneath me vibrate ever so slightly. My eyes shot open just in time to see a massive, otherworldly creature emerging from the dense forest, its towering figure casting long shadows in the moonlight. The beast's appearance was simultaneously awe-inspiring and utterly horrifying. Although humanoid in shape, it bore an extraordinary animalistic quality. Its contorted facial features were covered with folds of leathery skin, while sharpened bones protruding sporadically from its arms and legs resembled sanguinary branches and roots of malicious trees. The monstrous creature let out a blood-curdling screech before charging toward our campsite at incredible speed. Panic screams from our group rang through the night air as chaos ensued. In the midst of it all, my friend, Ain Schneider, received a vicious swipe down her back from one of those deadly, skeletal appendages. Paralyzed with fear but determined to help my friends, I reached for a nearby hunting knife to somehow fend off this fearsome predator. My other friends tried to scatter and hide amongst the trees in hopes of evade the creature's rampage. With the hunting knife in hand, I took a deep breath and tried to steady myself. I knew calling for help was futile there wasn't any cell reception, and we were miles away from the nearest civilization. I had to think fast or else this creature would maul us all. Amidst the chaos, my friend Jake managed to climb a tree and was terrified. Ain, who was lying on the ground and unable to move due to her injuries, cried out in pain. The creature unleashed another deafening roar before launching itself at Ain again. Acting on pure instinct, I stepped forward and threw the hunting knife directly at the creature. The knife found its mark and embedded itself right into one of its grotesque limbs. Surprisingly, it reeled back as if in pain. However, I knew it wasn't enough to bring it down. The others saw an opportunity to act two of them rushed to Ain's aid, while another attempted to grab a burning branch from the dying fire in a desperate attempt at self-defense. I yelled at them, We have no choice! We need to distract it and get away. My friends nodded in agreement but were too terrified to speak. We started moving deliberately around the area, drawing its attention away from Ain. Sarah suddenly had an idea. She whispered, Guys, there's a ledge nearby. If we lead it towards the ledge, maybe we could trick it into falling. Our hearts raced. But with no other plan in sight, we agreed to try Sarah's idea. We led the enraged beast towards a rocky precipice that overlooked a deep ravine below. As we moved closer, Jake continued to pelt it with stones he had managed to collect after coming down from the tree. Finally reaching the ledge's edge, we regrouped on either side of it acting like cornered prey on purpose. Seeing the creature charge us one more time, with a final combined effort, we all pushed against the ground and moved swiftly to the side. The creature was unable to stop in time, and its momentum carried it over the edge toppling into the dark abyss below. We listened as its dying screech faded away, and relief washed over us momentarily. With no time to waste, we turned our focus to aim. Jake found a thick branch and fashioned an improvised stretcher using our jackets. We hurriedly carried her through the dense forest in search of help. Fortunately, we stumbled upon a group of hikers the next day returning from their own trek deep within the Appalachians. They had a satellite phone and were able to call for emergency assistance for AIM. The rest of us draped in exhaustion and terror accompanied her until help arrived, the nightmare finally ending as we left those treacherous woods behind. Nowadays, we try not to speak of our harrowing experience with that horrifying creature, but it's something that will forever be etched in our memories.
The days that followed were filled with sorrow for Ain's suffering and gratitude for having survived such an encounter. We often think of those chilling moments in the forest, wondering about the fate of such a grotesque beast. Yet at the same time, we are grateful we managed to outsmart it and make it out alive. There's no denying that our lives have changed since that fateful night in the Appalachian woods. Some friendships have become stronger whilst others have drifted apart due to our inability to cope with what happened. But one thing is for certain we've gained a newfound appreciation for every single day we're alive knowing full well that there are terrors lurking in places where human eyes seldom glimpse. That incident has taught us always to remain vigilant and be prepared to confront any danger that might cross our path because life can change in an instant. I've always believed laughter is the best medicine. As a struggling comedian, I relied on humor to brighten my own days and those of the people around me. So, when my cousin Troy and I decided to go on a weekend camping trip in the Appalachian Mountains in April 2001, I was looking forward to enjoying nature, cracking a few jokes, and exploring my surroundings with him. We selected Seneca Rocks in West Virginia for our camping spot. The craggy mountain peaks and abundant greenery beneath the towering cliffs seemed like the perfect place to escape from our everyday lives. Our goal, or at least mine, was to hike, chat, and have an overall good time. On the day of our trip, we arrived at our campsite in high spirits. As we assembled our tent in a cozy nook encircled by massive trees, small talk and laughter filled the air. By nightfall, we were exhausted from hiking up the picturesque trails, so we lit a fire to roast marshmallows and ease into relaxation mode. After enjoying gooey s mores for dessert, I spiced up our conversation with a dark joke about strange creatures hiding in the shadows of dense forests like this one. We laughed at that ludicrous thought at first. It wasn't long before sleep claimed both of us despite our wild imaginations. The following day began with renewed vigor for exploration. The sun was shining through scattered gray clouds as we embarked on another adventurous hike up the rocky slopes. At one point during our trek along a narrow trail adjacent to an imposing cliff face, Troy slipped on some loose gravel and suffered a nasty scrape on his arm. But instead of panicking or succumbing to fear, he cracked a joke about how he'd make it out alive one way or another. I admired his indomitable spirit even in such circumstances. As evening approached again, Troy's injury showed signs of worsening. An unnatural purple hue tainted the edges of his scrape, and he complained that it felt like it was burning. Though concerned, we remained calm. We assumed that using the first aid kit to clean and bandage his wound would suffice for the moment, as we'd be returning home the next day. The sun retreated behind the peaks, coloring the sky with moody shades of orange and pink. As we settled around our second campfire of the trip, I began to notice a shift in the air. The once tranquil environment took on an uncanny silence with all nearby rustling leaves and animal sounds ceasing abruptly without explanation. Before we even had a chance to comment on the sudden stillness, a low growl emanated from just beyond our campsite. Both Troy and I were startled by this unexpected noise, having not seen or heard any other campers in the vicinity throughout our stay. As my eyes darted around in search of the source, I spotted movement just at the edge of shadows cast by the firelight. A hulking figure crouched down low amongst the bushes. I called Troy's attention to it as well, and we observed its bizarre and menacing form with a mixture of morbid curiosity and terror. 
The creature possessed matted fur covering what appeared to be muscular limbs, but it was its sickeningly twisted facial features that truly disturbed U.S. An elongated snout protruded from its head like a nightmarish caricature of a canine skull. Heightened senses, perhaps an instinctual response to fear, caused us to register an ungodly stench from our unwanted visitor. Troy decided that running away was no longer an option given his arm injury. Plus, it might have been dangerous to try in this secluded area with an unknown menace lurking nearby. The more prudent choice, he reasoned aloud between shuddering breaths, was for us to remain close together until the creature retreated or daybreak arrived, whichever came first. Yet, there was still one unresolved issue— Troy's injury. As we huddled around the fire, our backs pressed to the cliff side, the creature showed no signs of departure. Its growl grew more guttural and menacing. It paced along the margins of shadows, never revealing its full form but for the grisly tufts of matted fur that occasionally materialized in our peripheral vision. With each passing minute, the situation grew more desperate. The creature continued to lurk near our camp, occasionally flashing its sharp, glistening teeth as it snarled. Troy's arm injury limited our options and prevented us from climbing the cliff at our backs or attempting an escape through the dense forest. In whispers, we contemplated our next move. The thought of signaling for help occurred to me, but I doubted the efficacy of such a plan. Our cries could be drowned by the howling wind, or worse, further provoke the creature. Nonetheless, I couldn't suppress a panic-induced scream when the beast suddenly lunged towards us. Miraculously, it was held back by a thick, thorny bush that stood between us and its claws. The creature yelped and retreated momentarily while we gathered our thoughts. We decided that calling for help might be our only hope. Though it was risky, it seemed better than simply waiting for daybreak without knowing if we would survive that long. With Troy's support and encouragement, I screamed into the night, desperately hoping someone might hear us. We noticed the creature flinch at the sound but still didn't attempt to flee. After a few minutes of calling out and listening intently for any sign of response, we heard faint footsteps in the distance. The sound grew louder until another camper emerged from their tent nearby. Help! I yelled urgently as he rubbed at his eyes in a daze. There's some kind of animal stalking us. The bewildered camper nodded solemnly and readied his sturdy hiking staff before approaching our campsite cautiously. You two stay behind me, he said assertively. If that thing comes any closer... I'll try to fend it off long enough for us to reach safety. Together, we moved through the forest cautiously but with purpose, our only goal being to escape this nightmare unscathed. The creature trailed us relentlessly, its guttural growls echoing through the night. We didn't dare engage it. Instead, we focused on regrouping with other campers in hopes that there was strength in numbers. Upon reaching the main campsite area, we roused the remaining campers and explained our dire situation. One camper was an experienced hunter and devised a plan for our escape that didn't involve actively confronting the creature. As suggested by the hunter, we moved as a single unit while he led the group armed with his hunting rifle. We moved briskly yet quietly to avoid sudden attacks. The antagonists continued to stalk us but refrained from striking with the increased number of potential targets. As daybreak neared, we continued to forge onward until we reached the park ranger's station. They contacted a wildlife expert and assured us they would investigate this vicious animal and do their best to ensure it wouldn't threaten any more campers in the future. Relief washed over us like a soothing wave as we realized how fortunate we were to escape such torment relatively unharmed.
save for Troy's injury. As we returned to our respective lives, I couldn't help but look back on this harrowing ordeal and feel grateful for everyone who banded together. Their bravery helped us overcome this imminent danger, ultimately saving our lives. While no one would ever explicitly mention what happened that night, or even what kind of animal the antagonist might have been, the experience would forever bond us through a shared understanding of just how unpredictable and merciless nature could be. In August 2015, I moved to a remote cabin in the Appalachian Mountains to escape city life and find a bit of solace. My name is Russell Whitman and upon arriving, I figured a change of pace would do me good away from the hustle and bustle, pollution, and constant noise. So here I was, surrounded by vast, untouched wilderness, quaintly settled in one of the not-so-famous parts of Spruce Knob Seneca Rocks National Recreation Area in West Virginia. Around the second week in my new home, one of my letters must have gotten lost in its way to the nearest post office, as I received an unexpected visitor. The postmaster himself hand-delivered it, now that's dedication. Extending my gratitude towards him, Reginald placed it and I struck up a conversation which eventually led to him introducing me to a few locals. One of them happened to be an eccentric woman named Marguerite Houghton who claimed she had once narrowly escaped an encounter with an unnamed monstrous creature. The others told me that her tales were nothing but prattle. However, she stubbornly stood by her story. One overcast afternoon in mid-September... While hiking through the dense forest behind my cabin, I stumbled across a grisly sight. It was unlike anything I'd ever encountered before. A small cluster of trees had been completely stripped of their bark, deeply gouged by something sharp. The moist earth beneath them was littered with what appeared to be shredded leaves and torn pieces of cloth. At this point, any sense of humor disappeared as I recalled Marguerite's account and speculated whether this might indeed have been the slightly soiled handiwork of the elusive villain that everyone seemed so keen to dismiss as mere folklore. Over the next few weeks, I continued my hiking explorations around the Appalachians but kept an ear out for any animal sounds I didn't recognize or movements that seemed unusual or out of place. While enjoying a stroll along a well-trodden path one October Saturday, I found myself feeling uncharacteristically unnerved, as though I were being watched. Standing perfectly still, I strained to hear anything over the sound of my own pounding heart when suddenly, an inhuman screech echoed through the mountains. Unaccustomed to the local fauna at this stage in my stay, panic set in as I was envisioning Marguerite's description of a horrific creature bearing down on me with incredible speed and ferocity. My instinct to flee was almost overwhelming, but logically speaking, were I indeed being tracked by a predator, dashing off like sprint effort world gold medalist might not have been the best strategy. Thus, I reluctantly stood my ground and eventually realized the sound had come from much farther away than it had initially seemed. Suddenly, Hey there, Russ! It was Mrs. Landry Billodo from down the road delivering my mail. Caught off guard in my paranoia, I quickly composed myself before proceeding into an awkward conversation about her latest culinary concoctions laced with jokes designed to diffuse the tension from my brush with the unknown. I'd never really been one for fear-induced bedtime tales or jump scares. However, this perpetual sense of menace lurking nearby made even the most innocuous of noises unbearable at this point. Sleep became elusive and nightly treks through the cabin's creaking hallways had become routine. A few days later on what would be my final encounter, 
Darkness fell through cold mist as I took a peculiar path down to the river bank obscured by thick growths of rhododendron bushes. Sitting down on a moss-covered log contemplating my surroundings, that inexplicable feeling of being watched returned tenfold. As if reacting to my lurking admirer, the river suddenly morphed from a placid blanket to a churning torrent prelude to chaos. The trees above shook and shuddered as the wind gusted violently, signaling this moment was neither natural nor ordinary. Next thing I knew, something stomped behind me, startling, but unable to tear my eyes from the river now swirling with unnatural force. With a sudden crash, a massive figure emerged from the dense vegetation. The creature was like nothing I had ever seen before covered in dark, matted fur and standing on two legs like a human, but with elongated limbs that belonged to an animal. Instead of hands, it had sharp claws capable of shredding through flesh with ease, and its muzzle was filled with a set of razor-like teeth. Paralyzed by the scene unfolding before me, I remained rooted to the spot as the beast turned its attention towards me. It locked its eyes onto mine with what seemed to be hatred or rage burning within them. For a moment, our gazes held each other, mine filled with terror, and the creatures burning with fury. Finally finding my voice, I yelled out for help at the top of my lungs. However, there were no houses nearby, and nobody would be able to hear me over the roaring wind and raging river. The creature lunged forward in that instant, claws outstretched towards my face. Summoning every ounce of strength I had left, I rolled off the log I had been sitting on and narrowly dodged the creature's attack. Its claws slashed where I had been mere moments ago. Adrenaline pumped through my veins as I started running for my life. The monster chased me relentlessly pursuing me through uneven terrain and dense undergrowth as I desperately tried to escape its relentless pursuit. At last, by some miraculous stroke of luck, I managed to stumble upon a narrow road which led back towards civilization. With renewed hope in my heart and tears streaking down my face, I sprinted down the road as fast as my legs could carry me miraculously managing to stay ahead of the creature for what felt like hours but could only have been minutes, salvation appeared in the form of headlights cutting through the night sky. As if sensing some sort of impending defeat or danger, the demonic creature suddenly stopped its pursuit and retreated back into the darkness from which it had emerged. The vehicle that had saved me was an old pickup truck driven by a local farmer named John. He had been out on an errand when he happened to see me running for my life, terror plastered across my face. He didn't ask too many questions. I simply got into his truck, and he drove me back to the safety of my cabin. The next morning, still unable to shake the vivid nightmare of the previous night, I called Mrs. Landry Billodo to inform her that I would be moving out. Out of respect for Marguerite, I did not divulge the full details of my experience with the beast. However, she seemed to understand my urgency in leaving without further explanation. As I packed up and left that rustic cabin behind, one question still remained with me. What was that creature I had encountered? While Marguerite's warnings had indeed mentioned an unidentified animal, this monster felt like more than just a product of nature. It could only have come from a twisted darkness that nothing in this world could ever truly understand or explain. Thankful for my survival and the unlikely hero in John who had saved me from a gruesome fate, I decided not to pursue any answers about the creature. Instead, I simply accepted that there were still mysteries best left unexplored and focused on healing from the harrowing events of those unforgettable days in the mountains.
August 2019 was a turning point in my life. I'm Jake Thompson, and I was desperate for a change of pace. My monotonous job and the glaring city lights had an abrasive effect on me. A change was necessary. A co-worker mentioned a hidden cabin, nestled deep within the Appalachian Mountains, an idyllic spot where time seemed to pause. It sounded like the perfect remedy to my troubles. As I picked up the keys from the old man at the gas station on the fringes of the mountain range, he joked that, Last fella went up there came back with hair white as snow. I chuckled politely, though not fully catching his humor. Nonetheless, I smugly thought of myself as too grounded to fall for such tales. Driving along dirt roads and narrow paths, I made my way deeper into the forest until I arrived at my destination. About a week into my peaceful retreat, I decided to take a long morning hike into the valley below. The dew-laden grass beneath my feet crunched softly as I descended. As hours passed by, an overwhelming sense of unease sneaked its way into my soul. Just when I resolved to return to my cabin, it happened. From seemingly nowhere, a gut-wrenching scream cut through the still air. The sound echoed through the valley, a woman's voice mangled beyond recognition as if her vocal cords were being shredded in real time. Astonished by this jarring event in such a remote area, instinct screamed at me to follow the source. To my surprise and horror, I had stumbled upon a makeshift campsite resembling something out of a nightmare remake of Little House on the Prairie. Despicable acts had evidently occurred, torn clothes littered throughout shattered tents and bloodstains carefully spread along with soil and ashes. In shock at this grim scene before me, I backed away into surrounding foliage only to trip over something solid. To my revulsion, I turned to see a severed leg lying beside me. My heart pounded. This was beyond the realm of my understanding. The rational person in me wanted to call the police or anyone, but there was no cell reception amongst these ancient pines. Despite my growing fear, I resolved to help whoever lay behind those terrified screams. Remaining as inconspicuous as possible, I moved cautiously toward the lingering cacophony of terror until I caught sight of its origin, a creature on the loose. Something deeply sinister and grotesque was attacking a couple huddled beneath a fallen tree trunk. Fur covered and lanky with elongated limbs and vicious claws, the abomination tore at their flesh, leaving them barely recognizable. Paralyzed with fear, I knelt hidden within nearby shrubbery. While unable to unhear what transpired at the grisly scene before me, fate intervened. A small branch snapped beneath my trembling foot. The creature stopped instantaneously. Massive jaws dripping gore paused mid-crunch as it abruptly swiveled its head toward me. Bulging yellow eyes pierced the foliage and locked onto mine. Fear overpowered me like a tyrannical dictator, dethroning all previous occupants of my poise. My racing heart drowned out any noise left between the creature and me. Frantically trying to formulate an escape strategy while remaining undetected turned into an impossible task when suddenly, out of sheer panic and gut instinct, I launched myself from my hiding spot and barreled down the mountain as fast as humanly possible. Terrified for my life, I could see that hideous monstrosity pursuing me in every bare print on the soft soil. It felt like another inhabitant bearing its waist-long arms or gnarled legs while joining our perverse little race for survival in this godforsaken wilderness. Surprisingly, though, by some miracle, as I rounded a bend, I began gaining distance from the beast. Perhaps it wasn't as accustomed to human prey's speed, but my legs refused to slow down. Emerging from the tree line, I sprinted toward the dense forest ahead. 
Even as adrenaline-fueled energy coursed through me, tendrils of exhaustion crept into my core. I bolted past countless pines and over various routes, all while treading dangerously close to sheer cliff edges, territories where one wrong step would spell imminent doom. Nevertheless, that ravenous creature persisted in its pursuit. I continued running, desperate to put more distance between myself and that grotesque attacker. As I sprinted through the forest, I spotted a sign for a ranger station. If there was anyone around who could help me, I figured that would be my best bet, so I veered off in that direction. As I ran toward the station, I heard the creature's guttural growls and roars getting closer. My legs felt like they were about to give out from exhaustion, but I had no choice but to keep going. Eventually, I arrived at the small ranger station and banged on the door, praying someone would be inside and able to help. The door swung open, revealing a uniformed man. Without even stopping to explain or answer his questions, I shoved him back into the building and slammed the door shut behind us. Locking it tightly, we piled whatever we could find against it as a barricade, chairs, a desk, anything within reach. I finally took a moment to catch my breath and glanced over at the ranger, taking in his alarmed expression. My name is... it doesn't matter. There's a horrifying creature out there attacking people. I kept my voice low and controlled as the adrenaline began to wane. The ranger eyed me with obvious concern. We'll call for backup immediately. Moving to the radio on his desk, he frantically called for assistance, describing the danger and our location to whoever was at the other end of the line. As we awaited help, painful howls erupted outside accompanied by scratching against our makeshift barricade. The ranger's face grew pale, his eyes wide with dumbstruck fear. Conflicted if trying to shoot or confront this vile monstrosity would only worsen its wrath. Only silence hung thick between us. Time seemingly froze as we hid in that cramped room, both of us petrified of what would happen if that creature somehow broke through. Eventually, sirens pierced the air, marking the arrival of armed reinforcements. Not long after, the door burst open once more, and two well-equipped officers hurried inside. The ranger apprised them of the situation after which they cautiously exited to hunt for the monstrous threat. The grotesque noises outside dissipated, replaced by tense silence. Dread lingered, urging us to remain guarded until any semblance of safety was assured. The officers returned shortly after, trying to contain their shock and disbelief at what they had seen. The abomination lay dead at their hands. Finally able to breathe a sigh of relief, we exchanged scarce pleasantries before parting ways. The ranger and the officers bore weighty responsibilities as they contacted local authorities about disposal logistics and reassurances for frightened locals. Meanwhile, I wandered dazedly away from the station, this entire ordeal weighing heavily on my mind. It took me some time to process everything that happened. The images of those mutilated bodies beneath that fallen tree trunk will forever be etched into my memory. I never called for help during my escape because fear consumed me. Rational thought abandoned me in exchange for pure survival. I can only hope the rangers were able to identify and notify the couple's loved ones, providing them with any semblance of closure possible. And although I deeply wish we could have saved them or stopped this abhorrent creature sooner, I am grateful that it won't be attacking anyone else ever again. The haunting image of its fur-covered body, elongated limbs, vicious claws, and ghastly yellow eyes will likely stay with me for the rest of my life, an eternal warning against venturing too far into the unknown wilderness. But with time, I may begin healing from this ordeal, 
never forgetting but persistently moving forward into a cautious tomorrow. It was December 2016 when my life took a twisted turn. My name's Jared Partridge, and I was living in a remote cabin near Franklin, West Virginia, the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. I'd moved there seeking solitude after a difficult breakup with my girlfriend of five years. The tranquility and peace of the area were unmatched, but I could have done without all the mosquitoes. One evening, my neighbor Jed knocked on my door, looking red-faced and flustered. Jared, Jed panted, there's been a nasty accident down by the creek. I followed him to the scene. A grisly sight awaited us. There were tire tracks swerving off the dirt road and crushed vegetation surrounding what was left of a small sedan. The vehicle was shattered. Debris scattered all around the nearby trees as though an explosion had occurred. This doesn't look like any accident I've ever seen. I mumbled affecting nonchalance though horrified by the graphic scene. Do we need to call for help? Jed rubbed his chin. Cell reception is spotty around here, and judging from what happened, I'm not sure help would make any difference. Two days later, while hiking down in the woods behind my house in search of firewood with another neighbor named Lorraine MacArthur, we stumbled upon something strange. Large, deep scratches carved into several trees that made my back stiffen as cold sweat trickled down. I think we should get out of here, said Lorraine suddenly very nervous. Don't ask why. Do you know something about these scratch marks? I asked her curiously, but she only gave me a tight-lipped smile. Over time, odd accidents began piling up around our corner of Appalachia. People claimed they heard eerie howls echoing through the valleys at night, and some even said they saw something lurking on the hills. A tall figure with stalking stride and gleaming, blood-red eyes. Everyone attributed these events to the wild imagination of mountain folk, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were in danger. This feeling persisted despite my attempts at keeping things light-hearted by sharing silly jokes with my neighbors. Day by day, the fear took root deeper. One bitterly cold evening, I returned home to find Jed on my doorstep. His face was pale and frozen in absolute terror. I, I saw it, he stuttered. I was out enjoying some illicit pleasures when something lunged out of the trees at me. It was, it had the body of a beast and had human-like arms but with claws long, sharp claws, and its eyes. Jed broke down into hysterics, unable to finish his story. I rushed him inside my cabin, desperately trying to decipher his words and make sense of his claims. Three tense nights passed by. Disturbing noises echoed in the woods next to our cabin's twisted grunts, growls, piercing screeches that frightened us all. The night before the incident, I was having dinner with Jed and Lorraine when we heard an earth-shattering roar outside. We leapt from our seats, staring at each other in horror. The beast, whispered Lorraine gravely. We have to do something, I exclaimed as we cautiously approached the door to see what that horrifying sound emitting creature looked like. We ventured out into the freezing night. Heavy snowflakes fell all around us, mottling our vision as if emphasizing our damnation. Each step felt like it could trigger hell's fury upon us at any moment, as though whatever lay hidden in those snow-laden woodlands would strike, but we were compelled by morbid curiosity a sight too dreadful not to behold. Suddenly, in between our tracks leading back towards the vengeful woods lay a mangled deer carcass, 
Blood staining the snow a sinister red the sight was repulsive but excited us in want of validation to the existence of the macabre being that had brought alarm to our peaceful community. The creature knew we were coming even when we approached slowly armed and with suicidal bravado. It stood there, waiting for us, its monstrous body twisted like a nightmare, gleaming claws and eyes dripping with malignant fury its breath rolling out as cold smoke. My heart raced as Jed and Lorraine followed closely behind me. Our breaths created plumes of fog in the cold air. We stumbled over broken branches and crunched through the icy snow. Another guttural growl jerked us to a halt. The creature stood before us, its body a strange combination of animal and humanoid features. Its fur was matted with fresh blood, and its massive claws extended eagerly in front of it. The beast's snarls were harrowing, and its eyes were filled with an unquenchable rage. As we stared at each other, I knew that fighting this abomination was not an option. We didn't have the knowledge nor the physical ability to confront it head-on. We weren't prepared to die at the hands of this monstrosity. Jed grabbed my arm, his voice shaking. We need to get out of here. Now. I nodded vigorously, suddenly realizing that our curiosity had led us down a perilous path from which there might be no return. Now was not the time for foolish pride or confrontation. It was time to run. We turned on our heels and raced back toward our cabins, the piercing shrieks of the creature echoing through the woods behind us. Our hearts pounded in tune with our quickened pace, and fear drove us like never before. As we burst through the tree lean, I barely had any air left in my lungs to yell for help. But yell I did, pleading desperately for anyone who could hear us to come to our aid. Our neighbors emerged from their cabins, drawn by our cries for help. They stared back at us in disbelief as we panted out our story. Just as they agreed to help and started to form a search party to deal with this unknown threat together, another blood-curdling roar arose from the woods. The group of helpers hesitated for a brief moment, but decided to press on, uncertain of the fate that awaited them. I was too exhausted and terrified to join them, staying behind with Jed and Lorraine, who were also not in any condition to face the creature again. Hours passed as we huddled by the fire waiting for news, fear gripping our hearts. Finally, the group of helpers returned with grim expressions on their faces and blood-stained clothing. They had found the remains of several animals littering the forest floor but had been unable to locate the creature that had terrorized us. In spite of their fruitless search, the community was now on high alert. We knew that there was something out there, something unnatural and deadly. Armed guards patrolled our cabins at night, as we formed a collective determination to deal with the threat as one unified front. Soon enough, the creature showed itself again. Another earth-shattering roar terrified the shadows as it clawed its way through our once peaceful village. The guards fought bravely against this abominable foe they gave their lives in pursuit of our safety. And when it finally ended, we mourned their loss while celebrating their sacrifice. A somber memorial was erected for those who had given their lives during this dreadful ordeal. Though we didn't know much about our enemy or where it had come from, we knew one thing for certain. We couldn't let its reign of terror continue any longer. Days turned into weeks without further incident encouraged by each passing quiet night. It seemed that the determined actions of our guards had driven this murderous assailant away from our hallowed home. Nerves gradually settled over time in this small village where people once lived free from worry. Yet never would they look upon those surrounding dark woods without a fleeting shiver down the spine. Remembering what had been hiding in their depths, a part of each villager forever changed. With every wintry gust or distant howl, 
The whispers of fear crept through our minds, but against the terrible savagery of what lay undiscovered in those undisturbed forests, the united strength and determination of the human spirit held strong. We had faced darkness insurmountable and persisted, and we vowed united never to let our guards down again. It was December 2012 when my life changed, and I found myself confronting nightmares in the Appalachian Mountains I didn't know I was capable of experiencing. My name is Nigel Ferris, and at that time, I had just graduated from college and intended to take a solo hiking trip to clear my thoughts before delving into the post-college life of job hunting and financial responsibilities. My journey took me to an untamed region within the Appalachian Mountains. The air smelled fresh, and the quiet tranquility provided me with the sense of peace I was seeking. The landscape around me was breathtaking, with trees towering above like Mother Nature's skyscrapers and the soft hum of wildlife permeating through the crisp mountain air. I ventured deeper into the woods, wandering away from the designated trails, toward a small cabin nestled between two immense oak trees. Its blue paint was peeling off, revealing dark weathered wood underneath. It looked like it had seen better days. A strange curiosity pulled me towards that decrepit structure. As I approached closer to the cabin, an unsettling putrid smell wafted through the air. Then I noticed strange marks on the old wood. They looked like gashes caused by something alive but not quite human either. A shudder passed through me as it dawned on me what those marks might be, claw marks. Synapses fired rapidly in my brain as fear overtook curiosity. Something dangerous was lurking around here. Even though half of my brain stopped functioning out of creepiness, Another part whispered funnily, This isn't Disneyland, Nigel. Hey man, shouted a haggard-looking fellow as he appeared from behind a nearby tree. He introduced himself as Clyde Sampson, a hunter who lived in these mountains for several years. Clyde talked about a creature that roamed these parts and was responsible for those marks on the cabin and for countless maimed or even missing hapless wanderers like me. This sounded like bad news, but I needed a place to stay. He offered to take me in for the night. The creature had never attacked his cabin before. As the sun set behind high mountains, casting eerie shadows across the forest floor, an uneasy tension grew around us. Clyde and I sat in his cabin, sharing a simple dinner made of beans and canned food. The silence was occasionally punctuated by sounds from the darkness outside, rustling leaves or snapping twigs. Despite his rough exterior, Clyde's quick wit and sense of humor put me at ease. At one point during our conversation he chuckled. I'm not sure if it's safer living alone in these woods or in some city full of folks running around like chickens without heads. Later that evening, as we huddled around a crackling fire, the atmosphere suddenly shifted. Strange growls reverberated through the air, chilling us to our cores. Then everything went quiet again. The silence was short-lived as we heard heavy footsteps outside. Something big was stalking its way closer to us. Trying to keep his voice steady but not doing so well with it, Clyde muttered, we gotta be prepared for whatever is there on the other side. The door burst open with what sounded like the force of a raging bull. Standing before us was a hulking monstrosity either human nor animal. Its grisly appearance was grotesque, with muscle-toned limbs ending in razor-sharp claws and yellow eyes that burned like hot embers against its pale skin. I choked on my breath as I saw two sharp rows of teeth protruding from its maw, 
those teeth were definitely capable of ripping through flesh like butter. Petrified, we watched as it began to charge towards us. Clyde's hands trembled badly, but he somehow managed to reach for his shotgun leaning against the wall, while I clutched a hunting knife I had picked up earlier. Clyde aimed the shotgun at the creature, his hands still shaking. I gripped my hunting knife tightly and braced for the impact. The monstrosity lunged at us, and with a crack, Clyde fired a shot at the beast. It let out a pained growl and recoiled, staggering back. We seized the opportunity and ran towards the cabin door, quickly slamming it shut behind us. The creature's growls continued outside as we fumbled with barricading the door using whatever furniture was available. Why haven't we called for help? I asked Clyde, my voice strained and breathless. No signal out here, he replied, his voice tense. We're on our own. The creature clawed at the door relentlessly, its monstrous strength causing the makeshift barricade to shudder. We scrambled to find a better way to defend ourselves. Clyde rummaged through his belongings and pulled out an old flare gun. Maybe this will scare it off, he shouted over the deafening sound of scratching and pounding. I nodded in agreement anything was worth trying at this point. We waited for a lull in the beast's relentless assault before cautiously opening the door. The creature stood mere feet away from us its muscles tensed, ready to pounce again. Clyde fired the flare gun directly at it, engulfing the creature in bright red flames as it roared in agony and retreated back into the dark forest, leaving a trail of smoldering footprints behind. We didn't waste any more time to escape from that cabin. Gathering our essential belongings, we took off as fast as our legs would carry us through densely wooded terrain hoping to put as much distance between us and that cabin that nightmare as possible. As morning broke upon us, we could finally see familiar paths leading us back towards civilization. Exhaustion overwhelmed our bodies by then, but fear pushed us to keep moving. Upon reaching a populated area, we immediately contacted the local police to report the incident. At first, they were skeptical, considering the description of our assailant was nothing less than uncanny. However, upon further inspection of the cabin and surrounding areas, they found enough evidence to suggest that something malicious was indeed lurking in the woods. The investigation began right away. A few days passed by and despite our emotional and physical pain, Clyde and I remained close allies throughout the ordeal. We talked to the media, shared our frightening experiences while warning others of the potential danger hidden within those woods. The creature's remains were never found. People speculated whether it survived or not. Authorities urged everyone to stay vigilant and avoid venturing into that particular forest at all costs. Clyde and I spent weeks recovering from that dreadful night. We'd lived through a terrifying testimony of survival against a horrific beast that should have never existed in our world. It had affected us deeply. We could not forget those who'd previously encountered that ghastly creature, leaving their families searching for answers and closure. The horrible moments we shared now bind Clyde and me together in an unbreakable bond. With mixed emotions of gratitude and sorrow, we continue living our lives whilst honoring the memories of those haunted by that terrible entity. The forest still looms eerily in our minds, a chilling reminder of an experience too horrifying for words though life moves on, the shadows cast by that night will forever remain etched into our souls. The crisp September air enveloped me in a chilly embrace as I trekked through the Appalachian Mountains in Virginia. 
The year was 2018, and it had been a while since my last hike. I was desperate for some time outdoors, away from the hustle and bustle of city life. My name is Tobias, and I've always been an avid hiker. This trail was new to me. My friend Elias had been telling me about it for months now, and just recently he sent me an email detailing his experience on it. Elias raved about the breathtaking views and unique terrain of this particular trail. As I made my way deeper into the forest, the sun began to set, casting a warm orange glow over the foliage before me. Gradually, the temperature seemed to chill even more, a peculiar chill I assumed came with hiking in a new part of Appalachia. As night fell, I set up camp by a small creek that seemed relatively safe and undisturbed in the secluded location. I built a fire to keep warm and spent time chatting with other hikers passing by. We shared stories about our most memorable adventures before turning in for some much-needed rest. Later that night, I was awakened by a blood-curdling scream echoing throughout the forest. My pulse raced as everyone in the campsite stumbled out of their tents, dazed and confused. It wasn't uncommon for animals to make noise during the night, but this sound seemed bizarrely human. What on earth was that? One hiker asked frantically as he rubbed his eyes. Surely not coyotes. Another chimed in, shivering slightly. It's one man short of barbershop quartet out here, muttered another hiker half-jokingly to lighten the mood. We all nervously chuckled at his attempt at humor, but deep down we couldn't shake the uneasiness boiling within us. We decided to stay alert and went back to our tents, the screams still echoing in our minds. The next morning, we discovered that one of the hikers was missing. Panic set in as we scoured the area for any trace of him. After an exhaustive search, we found only his torn and shredded clothes, something no animal could have managed. The air was thick with tension as we sat in our campsite. Every sound magnified as our nerves were on edge. Days became a week, and I stayed true to my promise to Elias, taking precautions while venturing out on my own discovery of various unique spots within the trail. One afternoon, I discovered an old rusted shack hidden deep within the woods. It stood off to the side of a barren clearing, shrouded amongst overgrown trees and foliage. Curiosity peaked as Elias never once mentioned this shack on our numerous discussions on his experience here. Approaching cautiously, I nudged the weather door open with my foot. The hinges groaned in protest as I stepped into what seemed to be remnants of a small living space, but had long since been abandoned. Dilapidated furniture lay strewn about while broken glass crunched beneath my feet. Continuing my exploration of the shack's interior, I turned the corner and stepped into a small room filled with rotting food and a terrible stench that burned my nostrils. That's when I noticed something truly horrifying scratch marks on every surface, including human teeth and fingernails embedded deep within the woodwork. Shocked yet curious, I rationally pondered how this gruesome sight came to be. Suddenly, an inhuman roar erupted nearby, freezing me in place like a deer caught in headlights. Ankara beads of sweat dripped down my forehead as all rationality drained from my mind. This was no ordinary sound. There was an intensity to it that made my very marrow shake with terror. Heart pounding in my chest, I fled as fast as I could from the shack and stumbled back onto the trail. The roar echoed behind me, growing closer with every step. I clambered over rocks and branches, my lungs burning as tears filled my eyes. Whether it was fear or adrenaline clouding my judgment, I decided against calling for help. 
There was an unsettling feeling at the pit of my stomach telling me that doing so would only make the situation worse for everyone else. Running for my life, I couldn't risk calling for help as I didn't want to endanger anyone else or reveal my location. I fought the urge to look back, haunted by the terrifying roar of the creature that was pursuing me. My only goal was survival. As I raced through the woods, I stumbled upon Elias, who had noticed my absence and decided to search for me. Horrified but relieved to find him, we exchanged no words as he could clearly see the terror in my eyes. He instantly began sprinting alongside me, understanding that our lives were in danger. We moved together in a frenzied state, legs aching and breaths raspy. The creature's roars were persistent and unnervingly close, evidence that it was steadily gaining on us. We darted through trees and pushed forward with no plan other than to escape. Up ahead, we recognized a part of the trail near our campsite. Familiarity provided momentary relief, but it soon dissipated knowing that more people were now at risk. As we approached the campsite, hoping that whoever was there would have heard our approach and hidden away from possible danger, we suddenly saw the creature closing in on us. It was unlike anything we had seen before, a massive beast with matted fur, sharp claws, and saliva dripping from its jagged teeth. Its eyes revealed an intelligence combined with pure rage. It charged forward with a determination that left us both breathless. Elias fearlessly pushed me behind him as the monster lunged at him. Desperate to save his life but also stay true to our decision not to involve others unnecessarily, I fought against my instinct to scream for help or engage our friends who may be nearby. The creature violently clawed at Elias's arm. Blood poured from his deep wounds as he tried to fend it off. Somehow finding strength within himself despite immense pain and fear, he managed to kick the beast hard enough to momentarily stun it. We seized the opportunity and continued running. It was clear that we could not defeat this creature. Both injured and exhausted, we pushed on, making snap decisions to weave between trees and scramble up rocky terrain in an attempt to confuse our predator. After what felt like hours of running, we stumbled into a cave and squeezed ourselves into a narrow crevice. The creature's roars continued but seemed farther away this time. We hoped that our efforts to confuse it had succeeded, or, at the very least, bought us some time. Hiding in the shadows with our hearts pounding, we nursed Elias's injuries with what little supplies I carried. Fearful of making any sound that could reveal our location, we spoke in hushed whispers about what had just occurred. Grateful for having escaped thus far, we vowed to somehow warn others about the deadly creature while also steering clear of it ourselves. As dawn began to break, the roars from the creature seemed further away. We decided it was safe enough for one of us to venture out while the other recovered from their injuries. Elias insisted that I go and seek help while he stayed behind. I reluctantly agreed, promising him that I would return as quickly as possible. The journey to the nearest ranger station was long and treacherous. As I approached the building, adrenaline still fueling my every step, I shared our story with anyone who would listen, our discovery of the shack, encountering the horrifying creature, and how it mercilessly attacked Elias. Once support arrived at our makeshift cave hideout, they were relieved to find Elias alive but still wounded. The rangers promised they would do everything they could to locate and identify the dangerous beast terrorizing these woods. But as news of what happened spread throughout nearby communities, it became apparent that not only did we need to find answers but also determine how such an unknown creature had evolved into a ruthless predator. 
The memory of the shack and its chilling secrets still haunted us. But those shocking events became a catalyst for united efforts in protecting others from the dangers of the woods. Knowing that we could never truly return to our life of innocent hiking after experiencing such terror, we moved forward, cautious but purposeful in our pursuit of safety and understanding. Though the creature was never officially captured or identified, our tale undoubtedly saved countless others from the same terrible fate we faced. Our story served as a harrowing reminder. When venturing into the unknown, take nothing for granted and never underestimate the power of instinct. In October 2017, I decided to take a quick trip away from the city. The hustle and bustle was too much for me, and I needed some solitude for a while. As an amateur photographer, I thought it would be an amazing experience to capture the breathtaking beauty of the Appalachian Mountains during fall. My name is Derek Sanderson, just an ordinary guy who likes photography as his hobby. But little did I know, this trip would turn out to be something completely different from what I expected. A few weeks before setting out, I did my research and found an isolated cabin in a remote area located near Wits End in West Virginia. It was just what I needed complete seclusion in nature. I arrived at Wits End in my old pickup truck after tirelessly driving through scenic forests for hours on end. Eventually, I reached my destination, a lonely cabin waiting for me in the vast wilderness. It was a quaint little place owned by a reclusive old man named Ambrose Klein who lived nearby with his granddaughter Cora. They greeted me warmly and showed me around before retreating to their own abode. As dusk approached the following day, I grabbed my camera gear and ventured deeper into the woods to capture vibrant fall colors lost amongst twisted trees. After hours of snapping away, my concentration broke suddenly when the sharp sound of branches snapping echoed behind me. Startled, I spun around only to find nothing but an empty forest staring back at me. The eeriness of it all tickled my funny bone my sense of humor often worked as a defense mechanism in uncomfortable situations. Maybe Bigfoot wants to be the next cover model for National Geographic. I chuckled under my breath. I continued hiking through twisted trails when peculiar markings on the trees caught my eye. Deep claw-like gashes as if someone took a giant razor blade to the bark. Their placement seemed methodical and deliberate, and appeared to be leading me further into the dense wilderness. In hindsight, curiosity got the better of me. I should have turned back, but I didn't. It was becoming rapidly clear that something was amiss here, but I lacked enough sense to retreat. The sun continued to set, casting eerie shadows that engulfed the withering remains of day. A sense of urgency overcame me as dusk descended, driving me to return to the cabin before it got too dark. The trees seemed to bend inward, suffocating any paths I once knew, leaving me disoriented and lost in a sea of dead leaves. Then I heard it, a harrowing screech cut through the evening air like a blood-curdling scream. I felt my heart slam against my ribcage as I scrambled to trace the source of this unfamiliar terror. I stumbled upon a clearing, and there it stood, an unnatural beast with sunken eyes that glinted hungrily below twisted antlers. With limbs like grotesque tree branches and a mangled mouth filled with rows of razored teeth, it towered over its surroundings. Frozen in primal fear, all logic escaped me as the creature began to step closer in an unsettlingly calm manner. Intellect was replaced with instincts, and adrenaline coursed through my veins like wildfire escape became my sole focus. In my desperation to escape, 
I frantically searched for a path that would take me back to the cabin. The creature stalked closer, its twisted limbs moved unnaturally, and an overwhelming stench filled the air. It was as if decay itself had come to claim its prey. I wanted to call for help, but my throat tightened, refusing to let even a single scream pass. Out of options and driven by pure instinct, I sprinted further into the darkened forest, hoping that I could outrun this horrific being. The woods enveloped me in a suffocating silence as I ran. Only the pounding of my own heart and hurried breaths filled my ears. The creature pursued relentlessly, its grotesque form appearing and disappearing like clattering whispers in my peripheral vision. Fearing that this chase would ultimately be my end, I stumbled upon a shallow creek. Without a thought for my own safety, I dived in and submerged myself beneath the water's surface. The frigid current numbed me instantly, but pain was the least of my worries now. The creature entered the creek's edge, looming over the disturbed water with predatory intent. Time stretched out painfully as it assessed the situation. For what felt like an eternity it paused, perhaps unable to pinpoint where its prey had vanished off to. Just when I could no longer hold my breath and prepare to resurface, accepting whatever brutal fate awaited, the creature let out another harrowing screech and disappeared into the darkness of the surrounding forest. As quietly as possible, I emerged from beneath the water's surface, gasping for air. Although petrifying fear continued gripping me tightly within its icy embrace, hope flared as survival became a possibility again after that close brush with death. With renewed determination, I proceeded through the forest cautiously, making use of what little light remained from dusk, illuminating glimpses of familiar landmarks here and there. Eventually, as if guided by a divine hand, my feet brought me back to the cabin. I found my friends all gathered around a fire pit, indulging in a rather lively conversation. Shock set in as I tried to comprehend how any normalcy could exist after what I had just experienced. Unable to stifle a deep sob that welled up from within, I attracted their attention. Their faces morphed into masks of concern as they noticed my distraught state. One of them asked, Dude, what happened to you? However, the words remained lodged in my throat, unable to express any intelligible answer that could convey the horror I had just lived through. We left the cabin together soon after, not even waiting for dawn to arrive, and made our way back to civilization. Even then, the image of the monstrous creature and its sinister eyes haunted me incessantly. Upon reaching safety and recounting my harrowing tale, silence fell heavy in the air among us. The feeling of guilt and helplessness gnawed at my insides, knowing that our collective ignorance had lured us into something far more dangerous than we ever could have imagined. We contacted the local authorities with our story. They urged us not to return looking for answers. It became apparent that we were not the first unfortunate souls to encounter this terror lurking within those woods. Through it all, the bitter taste of loss and gratitude stayed with me, a cruel reminder of those less fortunate who had crossed paths with this unknown beast before me. In remembering them, we swore never to leave ourselves vulnerable again, a pledge born from the pain that could never be forgotten nor replaced. Now we remain vigilant, never daring to venture beyond where man should dwell, knowing well that there are horrors out there best left undisturbed. February 2009, I found myself far from the hustle and bustle of New York City, spending my summer at my family's small log cabin in a remote area of the Appalachian Mountains. 
My name is Leon Vasquez, and what began as a harmless getaway soon turned into something utterly dreadful. Upon arrival, I was greeted by my neighbors Darwin and Quinn, who were always ready with a joke or two. Leon boy, Darwin chuckled. We're glad you're here. The last time someone tried to liven up the place, they nearly gave us all hypothermia with that eye sculpture. The summer days passed lazily as we spent time fishing in the nearby river and exploring the surrounding wilderness. Life in the mountains was incredibly peaceful, until one evening when I noticed an unsettling pattern of animal disappearances. A couple of dogs had gone missing from nearby properties, and even wild game seemed scarce. The local townspeople, including Darwin and Quinn, began exchanging whispers about an unknown predator stalking the mountains. As isolated and skeptical as I was about such rumors, it became difficult to dismiss the eerie atmosphere surrounding our little community. One evening as the sun dipped below the horizon, I stepped outside to take out the trash and caught sight of something unusual near the tree line. Vivid crimson smeared across tree bark and leaves. Growing increasingly curious and alarmed, I grabbed my flashlight and ventured closer to investigate further. As I approached cautiously with my flashlight illuminating the way, I discovered a mangled deer carcass strewn across the forest floor. What made this discovery truly horrifying was how deliberately gruesome its evisceration appeared. While mountain predators are known to be ruthless killers, this felt significantly more sinister. The next morning after having a restless night's sleep, I shared my discovery with Darwin and Quinn over breakfast. Clearly disturbed by my gruesome story, they shared more whispers with an urgency I found disconcerting. During the following weeks, the predators' attacks intensified as more animals were found brutally mutilated, some partially eaten, which seemed to display an uncharacteristic cruelty. Local hunters couldn't find any signs indicating what the perpetrator could be. Fear was causing families to keep their children indoors, and dogs were no longer left unattended. The sense of dread was palpable. Determined to protect our small community from this terrifying threat, Darwin, Quinn, and I devised a plan to catch the creature in its tracks. Their expertise in hunting would surely give us an advantage against this elusive menace. Before setting out on our expedition, we shared a moment of dark humor. I hope you're ready for this stint at wildlife photography. Quinn jested as we armed ourselves with guns and high-powered flashlights. I was actually hoping for a spread in National Geographic, I replied sarcastically. We ventured into the woods as darkness fell upon us, following a trail of carnage that grew more ghastly with each discovery. As we crept deeper into the forest, an oppressive silence enveloped our surroundings. Even nocturnal creatures seemed too afraid to make a sound. Suddenly, we stumbled upon an immense clearing in the woods where we saw something that none of us could ever have imagined a beast like nothing known to mankind. Standing well over seven feet tall on its hind legs, it had thick black fur covering its entire body and possessed gigantic claws that dripped with dark red liquid. Its eyes glowed ominously like sickly yellow embers blazing through the night. We froze in place as the monstrous creature turned its gaze upon us. Its heavy, labored breathing made the air thick with tension. Darwin and Quinn exchanged uneasy glances before looking back at me. We all knew that we couldn't stand there any longer. We had to move. I looked around to find any possible escape route, but all I could see were trees, shadows, and darkness. However, I noticed a steep hill to our right that seemed to lead out of the clearing. It appeared as our best option. The creature took a menacing step toward us, 
snapping us into action. Up the hill! I shouted, and all three of us scrambled in that direction, desperate to get away from the creature. As we reached the top of the hill, I glanced back to see it lumbering after us, closing with terrifying speed. Keep going, yelled Quinn. We can't let it catch up. As we raced through the forest, dodging limbs and tripping over roots, I realized that calling for help was futile. We were deep in these woods and miles away from anyone who could assist. There was no one who could hear us scream for help over the cacophony of our heartbeats. The creature roared behind us, announcing its pursuit with guttural rage. I felt a sharp pain on my arm as its claws grazed me but didn't quite manage to catch hold. Darwin noticed my injury and urged me forward with a firm nod. We have to make it, Darwin said between heavy breaths. If we don't survive this, nobody else stands a chance against this thing. We continued to push forward until we found ourselves at the edge of town where the forests began to thin out. Relief washed over us as we saw familiar buildings through gasping breaths. Do you think it'll follow us into town? Quinn asked fearfully. I don't know, but we need to warn everyone. We can't let that thing hurt anyone else, I replied. The three of us rushed into town, alerting our community of the imminent danger. The townspeople quickly gathered, armed and ready to defend against the attack. No one was willing to take any risks knowing that horrifying beast was lurking nearby. From a distance, we watched the creature emerge from the woods dark fur barely visible under the shadows cast by the moonlight. It held, revealing its blood-stained claws as it stared down the group of armed townspeople. In that moment, everyone present knew what needed to be done. They charged at the creature with weapons drawn, driven by a burning desire to live and protect their families from this brutal monster. Even if we were outmatched and fearful of our lack of knowledge about the beast, we couldn't let it roam free any longer. In an intense battle filled with blood and fury, which lasted hours throughout the night, our community fought tooth and nail against the vicious creature. The ferocity of our resistance made it clear that we would not be toyed with any longer. As the first rays of sunlight began to pierce through the darkness, the brute finally succumbed to its injuries and collapsed in front of us. Our town had prevailed against this seemingly unstoppable force, but not without significant cost. We mourned those who lost their lives standing against such a vicious predator. They would forever be remembered for their sacrifice in defense of our community. Despite our traumatic experience and loss, we also recognized a renewed sense of unity among us. We had joined together to face an unimaginable horror and emerge victorious through our collective effort. Deep down, I knew that living through this nightmare would stay with us forever. Nightmares never truly fade away. But neither do tales of bravery in the face of terror, nor the strength that emerges when people band together. The nightmare may have ended, but the strength we found within ourselves and the bond that united us will live on. It was September 2014 when my life took an unexpected turn. I had recently become an amateur bird watcher and was hiking in the Appalachian Mountains, determined to catalog a rare species rumored to inhabit the area. My name is Leon, and at the time, I was just your average guy with a not-so-average hobby. One morning, as I set up my camera equipment near a remote stream deep within the forest, I stumbled upon something that made my stomach churn. A small pile of semi-decomposed clothes lay scattered on the ground accompanied by a couple of shattered bones, 
impossibly human. The stench was unbearable, but oddly enough, there were no flies swarming around it. I tried to laugh it off and told myself that some weird hiker probably misplaced their belongings and animals got to them. Little did I know how wrong I was. As the days went by, my bird-watching trip became less enjoyable. Perhaps it was my overactive imagination, but the unsettling sight had put me on edge, and every rustle in the leaves left me feeling uneasy. Even when hanging out with other hikers or campers, conversations felt shallow and superficial compared to what I'd seen. On my final day in the Appalachians, tired of birds and disconcerted by strange occurrences, I decided to pack it up early. As I drove down a narrow dirt path towards civilization, my car suddenly died on a steep slope with no cell service or any means of calling for help. Damn! I muttered under my breath as I popped open the hood hoping to spot some glaring issue that could be easily resolved. Need some help? Called out a voice that seemed to emerge from nowhere. Startled and relieved at the same time, I turned around to find an elderly man leaning against a nearby tree. Yeah, I responded warily. My car just gave up on me. The old man ambled over and we chatted as we assessed my vehicle's engine. As the conversation went on, I discovered he was a seasoned outdoorsman named Harold who knew the mountain range like the back of his hand. It's almost sundown, and you've got no signal, he told me. Come on up to my cabin for the night, and we'll figure things out in the morning. Skeptical but intrigued by Harold's quick solution, I accepted his offer. It didn't take long before we arrived at a cozy cabin tucked away behind a grove of trees. The inviting interior struck me as something out of a fairy tale, a comforting contrast to the mysterious forest surrounding us. That night we huddled around the fire, sharing survival stories and tales of our lives outside nature. The conversation soon drifted towards strange encounters in the wilderness. Harold's expression darkened as he slowly revealed that he's been observing bizarre patterns within the animal population of this area over several decades. Animals going missing or appearing in distress with no apparent cause, Harold said ominously. I can't prove it, but I think there's something here in these woods that defies explanation. Half-heartedly laughing off his remarks, I shared my recent unsettling discovery of bone and torn clothes. As I described what I'd seen, Harold grew pale. This is worse than I thought, he whispered under his breath. Suddenly, screams pierced the mountain air tortured cries which sounded both human and animal simultaneously choked off by staggering silence. My heart hammered in my chest as a cold sweat covered my skin. Everything felt oddly disorienting. Without warning, the door to the cabin burst open, revealing a monstrous creature shrouded in darkness, tendrils snaking from its spine while elongated limbs gripped both doorframe and floor simultaneously. Harold! Run! I yelled hoarsely unable to tear my eyes away from the beast. But my newfound companion remained still, stricken with fear as the creature slowly moved its horrifying form inside the cabin. As the creature inched closer to us, the terrifying reality of our situation dawned on me we were cornered and completely cut off from the outside world. My first instinct was to call for help, but nobody would have even heard our desperate cries. I knew we had to do something anything to save ourselves from this monstrous being. The creature's twisted body towered over us with gnarled limbs and a skeletal frame covered in decomposing flesh. The tendrils sprouting from its spine danced menacingly in the air, grasping for hidden prey as its sunken eyes scanned the room in search of potential victims. Its movements were gracious yet lethally precise, 
as if it was taunting us with the string of slow, elongated steps it took towards Harold and me. My legs trembled due to the heavy weight of desperation, and my voice cracked as I yelled at Harold again. Run! We need to find a way out of here! He seemed to snap back from the trance-like state that creature cast upon him, and together we decided in an instant to embrace our best chance of survival. We sprinted across the cabin, evading furniture and poorly placed objects while avoiding contact with the unnerving tendrils that stretched towards us. Our attempts at escape were choreographed by pure terror, yet, despite our fear, we managed to dodge and weave our way through many of the creature's attacks. As we reached a locked door leading out of the cabin, Harold frantically searched his pockets for keys, hands shaking terribly while keeping a wary eye on our pursuer. The creature lunged for us once more as Harold finally found the right key and unlocked the door. I shoved him through first and followed right behind him slamming the door shut in an attempt to buy us precious moments to flee. We stumbled into the moonlit night bruised but alive. However, our adrenaline-driven bodies were far from ready to rest. The thought of the creature effortlessly breaking through that door at any moment and continuing its pursuit urged us to move faster. Why didn't you call for help before? I panted, struggling to catch my breath as we pressed on through the dense forest. Harold shook his head, a grimace etched across his face. No one would believe this. Heck, most wouldn't even hear it. We circled around the mountain range, careful not to get lost in its deceptive labyrinth of trees and trails. We knew heading back into town was our best bet for escape and safety but only after putting a significant distance between us and that unholy abomination. After what felt like hours, we stumbled upon a hiking trail that was familiar to both of us. Guided by past experiences and with daylight gradually revealing itself, we dared to hope that our nightmare was finally coming to an end. Harold paused to catch his breath when we were close enough to notice the comforting familiarity of the town's distant skyline. As we looked back towards the treacherous forest, an uneasy silence hung between us its weight pressing heavier than any words ever could. A newfound unity born from surviving this ordeal bound me and Harold together, as allies haunted by a shared terror. We dared not mention the names of those who might have fallen victim to the creature lest they become too real in our minds. As we reached town, our tattered appearance drew concerned glances from neighbors and strangers alike. The truth we carried was too unnerving for their ears, so we provided vague explanations of encountering wild animals during an unexpected overnight stay in the mountains. The unimaginable horrors that Harold and I escaped may never be fully understood or believed. However, they will forever cling tightly to our hearts like a shadow in the darkest corner of one's memories an ever-present reminder that even in the most peaceful of places lurked a monstrous being capable of unspeakable evil. Our lives were saved yet forever changed as we learn firsthand that there are some things in our world that defy explanation, unveiling a frightening reality that not everything could be controlled nor comprehended by human knowledge and understanding. And even though we no longer dwell upon the nightmare Harold and I survived, we will never forget the chilling presence of the unearthly creature a specter whose origins remain a horrifying enigma. It was a warm June evening in 2018 when my life took an unexpected and terrifying turn. My name is Lyle, and I had always enjoyed the solitude of the Appalachian Mountains. I had a small cabin in a remote part of West Virginia, miles away from civilization, where I could escape the noise and chaos of city life. That particular weekend, 
I had joined a couple of friends, Elspeth and Reuben, on a camping trip accompanied by their dog Beetle. All of us appreciated nature's unblemished beauty and the sense of serenity it provided. We spend our days hiking the scenic trails, fishing in the crystal clear streams, and sharing stories around the campfire at night. One day, late in the afternoon after a long hike, we stumbled upon a small cave entrance hidden behind some overgrown shrubs. Curiosity peaked, we decided to explore inside. Elspeth turned on her smartphone flashlight to illuminate cavernous darkness as we stepped carefully over jagged rocks. Suddenly Beetle emitted a warning bark at something he caught sight of just up ahead from one corner of the cave. Our adrenaline spiked as our eyes followed Beetle's line of vision. We saw alongside an ancient-looking symbol drawn in what looked like dried blood on a cave wall. The smell that filled our nostrils reminded us of spoilt meat left out far too long. We exchanged disconcerted glances. Reuben made light of it with an awkward laugh and said, Well, folks, isn't that just ancient art at its finest? I tried to call out for help, but we were too far out into the wilderness with no cell service or any other means of communication. Later that night around the campfire, each joke we'd crack seemed like an attempt to defuse the tense atmosphere hovering over us ever since discovering that cave. None would admit it then but couldn't help feeling responsible for disturbing something unnatural and sinister. Sleep did not come easily that night as unsettling dreams and images of the gruesome symbol invaded our thoughts. Just a few hours after dozing off, we were disturbed by the ear-splitting sound of shattering glass. Startled from our slumber, we quickly dressed and rushed out of the cabin. We tracked down the source of the noise. It was from Reuben's car parked not too far from our cabin. Every window in his car had been smashed to pieces with shards of glass scattered around. The hood of the car had been torn apart like peeling open an orange revealing damaged and mangled internals. Our hearts pounded in disbelief and horror at the sight. None of us could comprehend how or why anyone could do such a thing in this remote area. Yet there we stood, forced into facing a reality far more terrifying than any one of us could have conjured up in our worst nightmares. The three of us were in shock but knew we had to take action quick before it was too late. As much as I hate to admit it, a sense of helplessness began settling in given that all lines of communication were cut off between us and any hope for rescue. Clearly, whatever was responsible wasn't human. The entity imagined solely to possess supernatural strength required for that kind of damage done to Reuben's car. No human creature could have demonstrated that level of ferocity without using tools or weapons. As darkness drew near on our final night, unease crept through every bone in our bodies. This sense intensified, strangling us with a cold, numbing fear, the kind that petrifies muscles stiff while making the mind race uncontrollably towards some semblance of rationality inside chaos. Suddenly Beetle, who had never once shown timidity before, now cowered silently beneath fallen leaves trembling as if sensing impending doom, all while staring at an ominous figure approaching at an unnaturally quick pace from the forest. We caught sight of the beastly figure, unlike any known creature, standing on its hind limbs as long human appendages hung by its side. It had matted black fur all over its terrifyingly muscular frame, and bared sharp jagged teeth while it dug its claws deep into the soil beneath it. The monstrous being lunged at us in one swift movement, its piercing shrieks echoing through the mountainous expanse as we made our futile attempts to escape the inevitable. We were fully aware that any paltry efforts we put forth would never amount to overcoming the harrowing nightmare we'd awakened from this deep sleep. 
Fear gripped us as we desperately tried to evade the monstrous being, but our legs could barely carry us fast enough, even though our minds screamed for survival. Our eyes darted around, searching for any sign of shelter or means of escape, but the dense forest offered little hope. The towering trees blended together into a wall of bark, while their gnarled roots seemed to trip us at every desperate step. We would have called for help if it were possible, but our phones had no signal in this remote area, and it seemed futile to cry out in a place where nobody could hear us. My friends and I split up in an attempt to outmaneuver the terrifying creature that was surely tailing at least one of us. My breaths came in ragged gasps as my body continued its desperate flight. I stumbled into a small clearing and hid behind a large boulder, just in time to see the beast charge past me after one of my friends. Run! I screamed at my friend, who was mere meters ahead of the relentless predator. It seemed as if surrendering myself was the only way to buy them some time, perhaps enough to escape. My heart pounded in my chest as I pushed myself off from behind the boulder and took off towards the creature with all my remaining energy. The creature hesitated for a moment before lunging at me with a ferocious growl. At that exact moment, I tripped on a protruding root and tumbled forward. This sudden change in direction caused the beast to miss its target. While it struggled to regain its bearings, I scrambled back up and continued running blindly through the treacherous woods. Miraculously, I came across an old hunting cabin hidden among the trees. Not caring about who it belonged to or how desolate it looked, I burst inside, slammed the door shut and secured it with a wooden beam. Out of breath and desperate, I searched the small space for a means of defense or anything that could help us. Night had fallen by the time I dared to venture outside the cabin. As if fueled by adrenaline, I found both of my friends huddled together behind a fallen log. They had managed to outsmart the creature and escape its wrath, though they bore bruises and scratches to show for their terrifying ordeal. We knew we couldn't stay in these woods any longer so we scavenged for anything useful within the cabin and started making our way back towards civilization. The journey felt endless as we moved cautiously through the woods, always wary of rekindling the attention of that nightmarish beast. Eventually, our surroundings transformed from dense forest to sparser vegetation, a sign that civilization was near. Relieved and injured but very much alive, we limped back into town and reported our harrowing experience to the authorities. Though we never saw the beast again, its image haunted our minds forever. We couldn't help but remember our fallen companion beetle, whose fate had been sealed that terrible night. As time passed and we slowly recovered from our trauma and heartache, we realized just how thankful we were to be alive despite being forever scarred by those horrific events. The creature remained unexplained, an unidentified beast lurking in the depths of the wilderness where it resided as a constant threat. Stories quietly passed to whispered conversations in town about grisly attacks in those same remote woods. It only served as a grim reminder for us, no matter how far removed from danger we might have felt, that horrifying creature still roamed out there somewhere, likely waiting for its next unlucky victims. January 2004 I was living in a quaint cabin situated in a remote area of the Appalachian Mountains. The remoteness was what I liked most about it, breathtaking views and days spent in solitude. My name is Bartholomew Harrison, but everyone calls me Bart. The day started like any other. I woke up, brewed some coffee, and went on my regular morning hike. 
As I was trekking through the forest, I suddenly stumbled upon an unusual sight. Muddy footprints alongside deep claw marks along a rugged path. Now I'm no stranger to wildlife in the mountains, but these were different. They appeared larger than your standard mountain critter prints. Chuckling to myself as I imagined Bigfoot wandering around my neck of the woods, I shrugged it off and proceeded with my hike. Upon returning to my cabin that evening, my friend Roger came by for a visit. Roger was a local who had taken a keen interest in knowing me ever since I moved to this secluded spot some years back. Hey, Bart! Roger exclaimed with his usual enthusiasm. You heard about that guy who went missing last week? Search party found him today, mauled beyond recognition. No way, bear attack? I asked. Well, he hesitated, rubbing the back of his neck nervously. It wasn't any bear or animal we've ever seen around here. We spent hours discussing the bizarre details of the poor soul's fate late into the night over several cups of steaming coffee until Roger finally decided to call it a night and head home. A few days later, an eerie sense of unease settled around the cabin while curiosity lured me back to those unexplained footprints in the forest below. As I trudged through thick foliage, I came across another set of those bizarre prints deeper into the woods where I hadn't ventured before. Just then, a blood-chilling scream echoing from deep within the forest sent shivers down my spine, compelling me to sprint towards the source of the horrifying sound. Right before me lay my neighbor Jane's dilapidated hatchback. Her windshield shattered into spider webs with dried blood and shards of glass strewn all around. I frantically searched the area, but there was no sign of Jane, no indication of what had happened to her. I knew I couldn't stay there for much longer, so I grabbed my walkie-talkie to call for help, but all I heard was static, far beyond the reach of anyone nearby. A deep sense of unease settled in as I realized how isolated we were out here. Later that night, Roger and I gathered near the hatchback wreckage. The sun had long disappeared below the horizon, engulfing the entire forest in an oppressive darkness creeping into our very bones. Our weak flashlights served as little comfort, flickering weakly between trees and displaced shadows. Jane and that guy. This can't be a coincidence. Roger whispered nervously, his voice shaking slightly. As if responding to our growing anxiety, we suddenly heard a growl echo through the inky night, low and guttural with menace dripping from every syllable. Flashlights finally gave us a glimpse of what emitted that sinister sound, an enormous creature with spiny fur loomed tall above Jane's car. Its dark and matted fur-covered powerful muscles stretching across its hulking frame, while razor-sharp teeth glimmered beneath a twisted snarl. It's not human, Roger stammered. Bart, what is that thing? Overwhelmed with dread, we locked eyes as we both took off running frantically back towards my cabin in utter terror. The only sound louder than our own ragged breathing was that thing crashing through underbrush behind us, relentless in its pursuit. Time seemed to distort as we ran through the forest with that primal fear clawing at our heartbeats. But as we neared my cabin, the moonlight illuminated it as our sanctuary in the terrifying darkness. Suddenly, Roger tripped on a hidden tree root and fell face first onto the damp earth. Without thinking, I reached down to grab him when we heard a primeval roar that shook our souls. There's no time. Keep running. Roger yelled at me, the light in his eyes fading. His expression told me he knew his fate could not be changed. With no time to think, I continued running towards the cabin and slammed the door shut, frantically searching for my cell phone. 
It felt like an eternity had passed while my fingers finally grasped it. I dialed 911, pleading with the operator for help as I heard that beast relentlessly tearing at the door outside. We need help. There's an, an animal or something attacking us in the woods. I screamed over the phone, aware that time was of the essence. Luckily, the operator understood my frantic call and dispatched a team of officers and animal control to my location. As I waited, my adrenaline surged through me with each vicious growl of that monstrous creature. The cabin shook from its powerful blows against the wooden door it sounded like splintering bones shattering through the night. The door finally gave way as claw marks gouged into the wood forcefully. In a last-ditch effort, I grabbed a nearby fire extinguisher and doused the beast's face in chemicals. The creature seemed disoriented just long enough for me to stumble back to safety. As it thrashed against the restraints of its new stinging prison, lights appeared in the distance they were here. The professionals approached cautiously as they took in the scene before them. Their years of training quickly turned to disbelief upon spotting that horrifying creature nothing could have prepared them for this moment. They formulated a quick plan and managed to subdue it with tranquilizers after a tense standoff filled with growls and shots echoing all around me. Officers filled me in on what might have happened leading up to this attack. Several campers had reported sightings of an unknown creature, but government officials dismissed these claims as misidentified wildlife. It seemed plausible given our location and Roger's encounter with Jane's car. As news spread about governmental negligence, people demanded change while authorities scrambled for answers on how such a dangerous creature had been roaming free for so long. They promised to put more focus on public safety, but it would never erase the lingering feeling of violation felt by those who had been affected by this monster. Roger's body was found at dawn, mauled and unrecognizable the sight was enough to make hardened officers cringe. The pain of losing a dear friend haunted me, but I remained strong throughout the entire ordeal knowing that there was nothing I could do differently to save him. He had made the ultimate sacrifice so that I could survive and tell our story. As days turned into weeks following our harrowing encounter, life resumed its normal rhythm. Though the forest that once provided solace now bred nightmares lurking behind each tree branch a stark reminder of Roger's absence. It's only through his memory that I found strength in continuing my life. As time went on, that traumatic experience eventually became a part of me something that made me stronger and more appreciative of life. Nowadays, as I walk through the woods near my cabin or late-night drives on windy roads, I'm often reminded of Roger his laughter and courage etched in my memories forever and every far-off growl or rustle in the bushes makes my heart race just a little faster than before. But there's also gratitude for the lessons learned from that nightfall. Lessons about survival and facing our deepest fears are something I will carry with me forever. As for the creature? It remains unknown to this day, maybe an undiscovered animal that mankind hadn't seen before or perhaps just one too cunning for us to grasp. But one thing is certain, it serves as a haunting reminder that there are things lurking beyond our understanding, waiting to strike from within our darkest fears. In March 2019, I moved from the bustling city life that I had known into a remote cabin nestled in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. The quietness and solitude were just what I needed after my recent divorce. My name is Frank Anderson, and little did I know that this seemingly ordinary chapter of my life would take such an unexpected turn. Within a few weeks, I had settled into my new routine, 
fueled by the desire to start afresh and prove to myself that I didn't need anybody else to find happiness. My weekdays consisted of working remotely on my laptop while listening to classic rock tunes, effectively drowning out the unique symphony of chirping birds and howling winds. The weekends were reserved for wandering through the sprawling trails that surrounded my new home. On one exceptionally warm afternoon in April, I decided to venture out further than usual. The sun saturated the lively forest with golden light as it filtered through the canopy above. Hours passed by, as did countless vibrant plants and playful streams until suddenly, my reverie was broken by an unsettling find. Nailed to a tree no doubt once a picturesque example of nature's majesty, there lay multiple sets of hiking boots with their laces tied tightly around rusty nails. Each pair appeared torn and tattered, but it was clear they belonged to different owners how peculiar. A shiver danced along my spine as I tried to rationalize what I was seeing. News travels fast in a small community like this. Soon enough, stories surfaced about the supposed reason behind those haunting hiking boots a creature that tormented anyone unfortunate to cross its path. Although skepticism initially consumed me, stringing me along like a marionette in its hold, it became increasingly hard for me not to give way to fear. I struggled between sleeplessness and vivid nightmares that bled into potential realities at night until finally allowing curiosity to grip my psyche one fateful day. While at a tiny general store not too far from my cabin, I overheard a conversation between its elderly owner and a customer. You know the saying curiosity killed the cat but we're not cats, the owner said nonchalantly. Most folks around here tend to accept these crazy stories as myths and move on. Intrigued, I asked them about their beliefs regarding the fabled creature said to lurk in the mountain shadows. They exchanged wary glances before Mrs. Marshall, the storekeeper, began recounting each harrowing tale she'd heard with unnerving fervor. She spoke of a monstrous silhouette streaking through trees, dark as midnight itself its massive form propelled by impossibly long limbs covered in coarse hair, or fur, that emitted guttural snarls powerful enough to vibrate even the tallest trees in its vicinity. Victims' experiences varied with each telling, yet remnants of mangled personal belongings left abandoned deep in forests were always a common factor. Alarmed by those distressing narratives and resolute to stay far away from this abomination, I resolved not to wander into the wood's depths again, until I couldn't anymore. The silence of isolation gradually gnawed at me, shredding my remaining sanity's fabric with each lonely day spent within my cabin's confining walls. Finally, one morning near June, Desperation outweighed my fears as I struggled into hiking boots bound to become another cruel statistic in this now ominous setting. Through dense foliage and water-slick trails I ventured on for hours hoping praying that Lady Luck would be on my side this time around. It wasn't long before an eerily familiar dense thicket stood hauntingly ahead, an imminent omen of what awaited me. As a vortex of terror cycled through me, the ground trembled beneath my feet. From out of the abyss, it emerged with a guttural snarl, an enormous beast with coarse, matted fur clinging to its elongated limbs. Without pausing for rational thought, I bolted through tunnels of tangled branches in a desperate bid to dissolve this living nightmare ordeal. As I ran, the underbrush tore at my clothes, branches scratched my face and roots conspired to trip me. The beast relentlessly pursued, never slowing despite the dense foliage that seemed to ensnare me. I could hear it snapping twigs and rumbling menacingly behind me. I considered calling for help, but who would hear me this deep in the forest? Even if someone did, would they reach me in time? 
it felt foolish to entertain this thought for long. Upon reaching a small clearing with a rocky outcropping ahead of me, I decided there was no option but to try and climb it. Ascending as quickly as I could manage, I scrabbled up the steep rocks, clinging to any crevice my fingers could grasp. As I reached the top and surveyed my surroundings below, I spotted the creature heading towards the outcropping. This allowed me a better look at it, larger than any bear but much thinner, thick black fur covering its muscular limbs, a hunchbacked form with piercing red eyes that seemed to be fixated on its prey, me. I had no idea what this creature was or where it came from. All that mattered now was keeping away from those feral teeth and sharp claws. Seeing an opportunity to temporarily distance myself from it, I jumped from one rocky ledge to another across the small valley below. Though the gory reality of potential death pressed closer with each moment, I refused to consider my demise just yet. All I could focus on was breathing heavily scanning for an escape route or place to hide. The beast bellowed below as it seemed momentarily confounded by rocky terrain. A massive limb thrashed at a boulder in its path only for it got lodged between two rocks. Seizing this opportunity, I sprinted along the slippery rocks risking a deadly fall over cautious footwork. This opening wouldn't last long. Despite my increasing exhaustion, I forced myself to keep moving, desperate to put as much distance between me and this monstrosity as possible. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I spotted what appeared to be a cave entrance in the distance. As I drew nearer, I noticed it was partially concealed by a broken tree. Climbing into the cave's dark confines, I hoped that the creature would be delayed long enough for me to find a place to hide within the dark labyrinth and cavern. The beast eventually freed itself from the rocks and resumed its hunt with renewed fury. The guttural growls and heavy breathing were now accompanied by angry roars that echoed through the forest. Moments later, my hope paid off. It couldn't find the entrance of the cave. From my hiding spot deep within its recesses, I listened intently as it snarled and sniffed around my previous location before eventually retreating into the forest. Though relief washed over me, survivor's guilt soon followed as I recalled those less fortunate left with belongings abandoned in the woods. It seemed impossible to wrap my head around my own escape when their misfortune was so horrifyingly evident. In time, I gathered the courage to leave my hiding place and trekked warily through the forest back towards civilization. Once safe, I contacted authorities who insisted on investigating further despite my pleas to leave well enough alone. They inevitably found nothing but debris from past unfortunate encounters, no beast or proof beyond battered belongings and bloody remains. The creature appeared to have vanished as mysteriously as it arrived. Though part of me wished for answers or closure, perhaps it was better for people not knowing about this horrific entity lurking in shadows that could resurface at any moment. September 2012 a late weekend, my friends and I decided to take a spontaneous camping trip as a way to blow off some steam after a hectic work week. The Appalachian Mountains seemed like an ideal getaway to escape the busy city life. I'm Cameron, your ordinary guy who works a Monday to Friday desk job. My friends are Harrison, a financial consultant with a knack for making people laugh with his puns, and Lily an artsy graphic designer who always manages to see the beauty in the scariest situations. We were fully packed with enough food and supplies for the weekend and hit the road mid-morning. As we drove up into the mountains, we passed through Fleming Reservoir, which was known for its mesmerizing sunsets. 
Small towns were scattered throughout our route, but as we continued deeper into the mountains, they became less frequent. The terrain grew more rugged with every mile, and the landscape was breathtaking. As we made our way up a particularly steep incline with narrow winding roads that flanked deep valleys below, Harrison cracked jokes about how he hoped we wouldn't meet some axe-riddled maniac hiding in plain sight. We finally reached our destination, an isolated spot nestled within a dense forest alongside a pristine riverbank, and set up camp at dusk. Since the campsite was quite remote, we were confident no one would bother us. After having some dinner around the campfire and exchanging humorous stories about our lives, we noticed strange noises echoing from deep within the forest. Distant animal-like howling accompanied by an unsettling series of clicks and snarls that sent chills down our spines. "'What is that?' asked Lily nervously, trying to make light of the situation by resorting to humor. "'It's probably just an opera-loving raccoon rehearsing for his favorite Pavarotti aria,' replied Harrison smirking. We nervously laughed along but couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. As the night progressed, we wrapped up in our sleeping bags and drifted off to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was startled awake by a gut-wrenching scream. My heart raced as I jolted up, looking around wildly. It was Lily. She was bent over and gasping for breath. The muscles in her face strained with horror, as she sobbed uncontrollably. Harrison is gone, she wailed hysterically. Panic-stricken, we searched our surroundings but found nothing. Why would he just leave like that? He didn't even take his backpack or flashlight. As we continued searching frantically for Harrison, something shuffled loudly in the darkness near us. Our eyes widened with fear as we looked at each other then back at the darkness as a hulking figure emerged slowly. The moon provided just enough illumination for us to see a large animalistic creature with elongated limbs that were nearly twice the length of any person's and a snout full of vicious-looking teeth. Its eyes glinted with menacing malice. Lily let out another horrified scream before she grabbed my arm and violently dragged me away from that visceral scene towards an area of denser trees. We couldn't believe what we had seen and were absolutely terrified. What about Harrison? Our phones are. I stammered as I realized calling for help would be hopeless. No reception here, Lily whispered numbly. She was right. No one would answer our distress call even if we did manage to get through. The creature still stalked behind us, keeping pace despite its slow movements. We had no idea how fast it could move, nor did we want to find out. It was menacingly patient as if it enjoyed wearing its prey down psychologically before striking physically. We stumbled upon a large cave entrance. And without thinking for a moment whether the decision was wise, we decided to venture inside in a desperate attempt to escape this appalling nightmare. As we pushed deeper into the cave, the noises from outside seemed to lessen, but our hearts remained imprisoned in terror. A little further in, we discovered another blood-chilling sight a pile of decomposed human remains left strewn on the wet cavern floor. The nauseating smell of decay and death lingered in our nostrils as we realized that this creature had been preying on humans for quite some time. As we stood there, horrified by the sight of the decomposed human remains, we couldn't help but think about Harrison. Was he among these unfortunate victims? We knew we needed to find a way out as soon as possible. Let's keep moving, Lily whispered clutching my arm tightly. We moved further into the cave, hoping the creature hadn't noticed our presence in its lair. We were cautious not to make any noise, but every step we took echoed through the cavern. 
As we reached what seemed like the end of the cave, we stumbled upon a steep drop that led into darkness. We can't go any further, I murmured to Lily. Seems like there's no way out. As terror and despair filled our minds, we heard heavy breathing above us. The creature had found us. It must have been able to hear every footstep we took. We were trapped with nowhere to escape. The creature leaped down and landed between us and our only exit. It snarled with malice as it paced back and forth, watching our every move. I held on to Lily tightly. There was no way out of this nightmare. That's when Lily had an idea. The flare gun! She whispered into my ear while rummaging through her backpack for the emergency tools she always carried on camping trips but never used until now. Her hands shaking violently, Lily raised the flare gun at the creature and pulled the trigger. A deafening bang echoed in the cave as a bright red flash hurtled straight into the creature's grotesque face. The monster screamed in agony and recoiled from the unexpected pain and blinding light. Its agonizing wails echoed through the cave as it retreated back towards its gruesome lair. Taking advantage of this momentary distraction, we made a run for it outside of the cave and didn't stop until we reached a clearing where our campsite was set up. Gasping for breath, we grabbed our backpacks and prepared to leave as fast as we could. As we fled down the mountain trail, we could hear the ugly wail of the creature fading into silence in the distance. We were relieved and terrified at the same time. We had escaped certain death, but at what cost? Harrison was still lost, and countless others had fallen prey to the beast that haunted these woods. Upon reaching civilization again, we went straight to the police and informed them about our nightmarish ordeal. At first, they were skeptical about a large unknown creature stalking and killing people in the forest, but our disheveled appearance and genuine fear convinced them to take our story seriously. A search party was sent to find Harrison and investigate the cave where the creature lived. However, their efforts turned out fruitless. They couldn't locate either Harrison or the cave we described with such gruesome detail. Days turned into weeks with no news about Harrison or any other victims. The forest still held a deep feeling of dread for us as investigators continued to search for any clues to unravel this dark mystery. Lily and I returned home, thanking our lucky stars that we're still able to breathe another day after such a harrowing experience. However, every so often, I still wonder what happened to Harrison, imagining his fate is worse than knowing it. From that day on, both of us stayed far away from camping trips in secluded forests where darkness held more horrors than one could ever imagine. To this day, I can't walk through the woods without feeling my heart race and hearing those agonizing wails echo through my mind. It was mid-June 2016 when my cousin Stephen and I planned a hiking trip through the Appalachian Mountains. We were both eager for adventure and hoped to explore parts of the wilderness that not many people had seen. We decided to go off the beaten path, leaving behind our mundane lives and immersing ourselves in what nature had to offer. Stephen and I had always been close perhaps even closer than siblings. In our tight-knit family, we were known for our shared sense of humor and constant banter. I bet you'll be begging me to save you from a chipmunk before this trip is over. I teased Stephen, while he stuffed an excessive number of granola bars into his backpack. Upon arriving at our chosen campsite, we were immediately struck by the captivating beauty of the environment that surrounded us. Ancient trees reaching for the sky, stones weathered by time's relentless hand, 
and the gentle murmur of a stream just beyond our sight, it all felt like something out of a fairy tale. On our second day in this remote area, we came across a gruesome sight a mutilated deer hanging from one of the branches of a tall tree. This macabre scene was odd for several reasons, first being that predators in this area don't tend to leave their kills exposed like that. Furthermore, the way its body was twisted at such an unnatural angle sent chills up our spines. We debated whether it was best to return to civilization and report this sickening scene or continue with our journey, hoping we wouldn't run into whatever or whoever might have done such a thing. Clearly driven by curiosity, we decided to venture further into the wilds. Four days later, as we continued deeper into the woods exploring new peaks and valleys, we stumbled upon an old dilapidated cabin half hidden behind overgrowth. Figuring it was abandoned long ago, Stephen and I cautiously approached it, curiosity winning out over fear. As we entered the cabin, we noticed long scratch marks engraved on the wooden walls, their depth and position unsettling and eerily unnatural. There was also a strong, pungent odor of rot emanating from every corner. Suddenly, our entire story took an unexpected turn just as we stepped out of the cabin. We spotted an unnerving creature in the distance. At first glance, it appeared to be ripping debris off what seemed like a hunter's carcass, its fur matted with blood and dirt. No animals native to this area were known to exhibit such unusual traits or gruesome behavior. Shaken by the sight, we urgently devised a plan to escape this increasingly sinister situation. Retracing our steps through the forest, it didn't take long for us to realize that this creature was following us. The unsettling crack of branches snapping in the distance haunted our every step. Recklessly evading capture by this often diminished distance adversary, our brisk walk swiftly gave way to a panicked run. Running for our lives while trying not to lose sight of each other was far from easy. As the tree line opened up ahead of us, we suddenly found ourselves face to face with the creature that had been stalking us. This hideous beast stood on two legs, about eight feet tall. Its matted fur-covered body reeked of death and decay, as if it had never known cleanliness in its unnatural life. The twisted snarl on its lips and the gleaming hunger in its eyes left no doubt in our minds that we stood before something truly evil, an abomination that belonged only in myth and legend. This is it, yelled Stephen as he reached into his backpack for his knife. We need to take this thing down, otherwise we'll never get out of here. I grabbed Stephen's arm. Wait, I urged him. We don't know what this thing is capable of. Let's not take any unnecessary risks. As he hesitated, the creature lunged toward us. Quickly, I pushed Stephen out of its way, barely avoiding its attack. Let's get out of here. Stephen shouted, and we sprinted back towards the direction from which we came. As we ran, my cell phone chimed in my pocket. The sound startled me for a moment, but then I remembered that we had signals since we were close to the edge of the forest. I yanked it out and frantically dialed 911. Hello? We need help in the forest near location. There's a deadly creature following us. I tripped over my words as adrenaline pumped through my veins. The operator calmly requested more information, making it apparent that she struggled to believe our story. Nevertheless, she agreed to dispatch help immediately. There's help on the way. I told Stephen as we continued running. We had to buy time until help arrived. Despite our best efforts, the creature closed in on us with frightening ease. Knowing that it would only be a matter of time before it caught up to us entirely, 
It dawned on me that we needed another plan one that didn't involve running blind in panic. Stephen, you try to distract it while I find something we can use to defend ourselves. I instructed him as fast as I could manage. He nodded fearfully but bravely stepped forward, his arms raised cautiously while attempting to get the creature's attention. Hey! Come and get me! He taunted desperately. While he struggled to hold the monster at bay, my gaze swept the area for a possible weapon a heavy branch or anything else sturdy enough to make a difference. The creature snarled menacingly at Stephen, its massive teeth and deadly claws glinting in the dim light. But with each taunt, Stephen bought valuable time. Finally, I found a suitable tree branch that had fallen to the ground. I gripped it tightly and approached the creature from behind. In that moment, I realized that I had to summon all of my courage to take action. I mustered every ounce of strength and swung the branch at the creature's head, connecting hard with a sickening crack. The monster staggered back in pain, disoriented and angry. We need to run, now! I ordered Stephen as we bolted in the direction of what we believed to be safety. Minutes later, we could hear the sound of sirens in the distance, growing louder as they approached our location. Relief flooded through my body. Hopeful that those sirens signified our rescue, we pressed on, despite our encroaching exhaustion. As the police officers arrived at our location, we warned them about the grotesque creature lurking nearby. Still panting heavily from our dramatic escape ordeal, we struggled to provide a coherent description of the beast that left officials skeptical but wary. The officers escorted us back to their squad cars before assembling a search party for any evidence of this bizarre encounter. After hours spent scouring forest grounds, they found nothing but claw marks on trees similar to those inside the cabin. With no tangible evidence or any further sightings of this malicious creature and faced with mounds of paperwork ahead of them due to our pressing emergency call, officials ultimately decided to let us go home, shaken but grateful for our lives. Stephen and I vowed never to venture into that forest again. The chilling scratches on both the cabin walls and tree trunks would forever serve as haunting reminders of the unknown horrors lurking within depths best left untouched by curious onlookers such as ourselves. It was August 2001 when I decided to take a break from my monotonous city life and escape to the Appalachian Mountains for some peace and relaxation. My name is Kieran Sampson, and like any other person with a 9-to-5 job, I craved the tranquility of nature now and then. I chuckled as I thought about my unusual last name. Indeed, it's not every day you meet a Sampson. I chose a lesser-known area for my hideaway, Murray's Forest Reserve, near a small village named Pine Hollow. The reserve was known for its breathtaking views and the occasional sighting of elusive wild animals that kept their distance from humans. I knew little about what awaited me in the Appalachian Mountains, but sometimes, curiosity can lead to unexpected experiences. In no time, I found myself comfortably tucked away in Murray's Reserve, setting up camp adjacent to a gently flowing creek. Despite my skepticism of ghost stories and strange tales, experiencing the raw beauty of nature evoked a humbling vulnerability within me that quickly became addictive. During my first week there, I had interacted with some locals from Pine Hollow. They were amicable folk with generously shared their region's history stories about midnight moonshining parties and legendary hunting expeditions that entertained yet never peaked suspicion. We exchanged jokes and laughed together as they filled me in on notable events in their lives. 
It was through them that I learned about an ominous creature rumored to live deep within the confines of Murray's Reserve, one that has eluded capture for generations. Fast forward two weeks while hiking on a winding trail early one morning near the base of Dead Man's Ridge, an odd name for a place so full of life, I stumbled upon something that shook me profoundly. There laid what appeared to be human remains enclosed by a bloody tarp next to an abandoned truck with an out-of-state license plate. What I saw terrified me, not only the sight of the torn flesh and crushed bones, but also the manner in which it was done. This person had been subjected to a torment far worse than any ordinary animal attack. Upon closer inspection, the wounds were inconsistent with known predators in Appalachia and unsettling realization that a natural predator did not inflict this carnage. Panicking, I stumbled back to Pine Hollow as quickly as I could for my own safety. Conflicted about whether or not to contact authorities, I decided instead to warn the locals of my ghastly discovery and ask if anyone had recently gone missing. To my surprise, everyone shrugged off my report they had their suspicions about something sinister lurking in their midst. Within days, word had spread about other chilling events, overturned trash cans with claw marks too deep and numerous for any conventional animal, livestock devoured with surgical precision, and distant howls that echoed menacingly across the mountainside. The townsfolk began arming themselves with rifles and firearms, preparing for a showdown with whatever gruesome creature had been terrorizing their pastoral way of life. As the reports increased, so did my curiosity about this enigmatic beast. Simultaneously feeling compelled to investigate and fearing for my safety, I wrestled internally with a daunting decision. While staying in Pine Hollow, I struck up a friendship with a local man named Josiah Faulkner. He shared his experience during one blackout night when he claimed to have seen it a grotesque beast emerge from the shadows, its eyes burning like embers from the deepest pits of hell. It was massive at least ten feet tall and covered in coarse fur that reeked of decay and death. Its hooked claws tore effortlessly through anything it touched. Unsure whether to entirely believe Josiah's account or chalk it up to local lore, I found myself opening up about my gut-wrenching encounter near Dead Man's Ridge. Josiah silently listened as I recounted the gruesome details, all the while staring blankly at the floor. We looked at each other anxiously and came to a chilling conclusion— this monstrous terror could not continue to have free reign in these woods. It was up to us, Josiah and me, to confront it head-on fearlessly. We banded together with several locals and armed ourselves as we prepared for a daunting mission. With our ragtag group assembled, we devised a plan to search for the creature in the woods surrounding Pine Hollow. We figured that if we split into two teams— we'd cover more ground and increase our chances of finding the beast. The townspeople agreed, still hesitant but determined. The first team consisted of Josiah, me, and three other locals who knew the terrain well. The second team was made up of other experienced huntsmen and trackers from the community. We set off, armed and anxious, our mission clear, to rid Pine Hollow of this monstrous threat. Our team trekked deep into the forest, carefully scanning the area for any signs of the creature. We initially found little to indicate its presence, apart from some shredded foliage and uprooted trees. But soon enough, we stumbled upon a grisly sight of mutilated deer carcass, its flesh ripped apart with horrifying precision. The sight unsettled us all greatly, but we pressed on. We had to find this creature before anyone in town fell victim to it. The second team reported similar findings through walkie-talkies, confirming it wasn't an isolated incident. 
We continued for hours without further incident until we heard chilling howls echoing from somewhere in the distance. They were horrifyingly familiar, reminiscent of those I heard at Dead Man's Ridge. Our radio crackled. It was the second team alerting us that they had made visual contact with the creature near a clearing. We rushed towards their location as panic surged through us all. We struggled to keep ourselves from panicking as we neared where they said they saw it lurking within a dim thicket from the cover of darkness. Upon reaching them, we found the second team shaken but unharmed. The creature had vanished when they attempted to confront it with their rifles. We regrouped and cautiously proceeded towards where they had last seen it disappear into shadows. An acrid scent of decay hung heavily in the air, making us all gag. Two members from our search party decided to call for additional help from Pine Hollow. They reasoned that we were in over our heads and needed proper reinforcements to handle this situation. As the others went to call for help, we continued with great trepidation. Suddenly, emerging a short distance ahead of us was the horrifying creature. It stood before us on two massive legs, its viscous eyes eerily gleaming as it sized us up. A guttural growl emanated from deep within its mangled maw, reverberating across the forest floor. For a moment, we all stood frozen in terror then all at once, a chaotic symphony of gunshots rang through the air around us. Our bullets seemed to barely slow the monstrosity down as it lunged viciously at one of our members, its sinister claws tearing deeply into his side with ease. He screamed out in agonizing pain as the rest of us fired everything we had to try to save him and finally drive off the creature. Despite our efforts, he died within mere moments I'll never forget the harrowing sound of him taking his last breaths. As his lifeless form crumpled to the ground, the creature let out one final deafening roar before retreating back into the shadows with unbelievable speed. We were injured and shaken but alive. With heavy hearts, we solemnly carried his body back towards Pine Hollow. The town grieved for both the victim and each other's safety. For days after that incident people searched for that feral fiend, armed with rifles and ready for a fight, but no trace was found. The people of Pine Hollow did not forget those terrifying events and made a small memorial near Dead Man's Ridge, a simple but powerful reminder of what they lost on that tragic night. Our friend will forever be remembered as one of many who stood up to face the monster that had haunted Pine Hollow. We hoped the creature had moved far away to another territory its reign of terror over our peaceful town finally brought to an end, but a sense of unease always lingered. The town slowly returned to living their simple lives, forever watchful and ready to face any lurking terrors in the woods. I had lived in a rented cabin on the outskirts of a remote town in the Appalachian Mountains for about three months. It was April 2019, and I needed some time away from the hustle of city life to focus on my writing. My name is Edgar, but people usually call me Eddie. One particular night, after digesting my homemade meatloaf paired with one of those cheap beers you find on the bottom shelf at the grocery store, I decided to take a long walk to help me get rid of that bloated feeling. I figured it would also solve the itchiness from sitting in front of my laptop all day. Most creative ideas come when you least expect them, and tonight, it seemed like a perfect wild idea would be born. As I started walking, my beer-infused thoughts propelled my feet down various pathways through the woods near my cabin. Some paths seemed to open up into wide clearings, while others led deeper into the forested areas filled with shadows. At one point, as I was beginning to feel tired and winded, 
I spotted something quite peculiar, a broken bracelet made out of human teeth. What kind of macabre sense of humor did someone have to make this? Before having more time to contemplate that strange sight, horrifying screams erupted not far from me. There had been attacks around these parts lately, mostly targeting local farm animals. Suddenly, a man named Dominic emerged from one of the nearby pathways covered in blood and dirt. He was gasping for air as he stumbled towards me. Help! Please! It's coming! He panted desperately between gasps of air. What happened? I asked urgently while trying to support his weight. Dominic struggled to find his breath before saying, I had got those campers by the river. A cold chill ran down my spine. What got them? Before Dominic could answer another series of blood-curdling screams echoed through the woods accompanied by the sickening sound of bones snapping. That was enough to spur both of us into a sprint. Twigs and branches slapped our faces as we ran blindly, desperately trying to get away from the nightmarish grunts, snarls, and horrific tearing sounds. Dominic doubled over in pain from his injuries, tears streaming down his cheeks. We found ourselves heading into an ominous clearing with dead trees looming over it. I spotted a torn piece of fabric dangling off nearby branches from the campers Dominic mentioned earlier. My gaze fixated on the terrifying sight of a creature beyond anything I'd ever imagined, a grotesque beast with twisted limbs and skin covered in matted hair. My heartbeat hammered in my ears as the creature effortlessly tore through furrowed earth in its pursuit. Crimson streaks decorated its twisted visage as it drew closer to us. Endorphins kicked in and shot us into a new gear, sprinting towards an old, crumbling hut that seemed our best chance for survival. Dominic stumbled ahead of me and busted through the hut's splintered door to take shelter inside. I raced after him but tripped on my own feet just before reaching full cover. Dread sank its icicle fangs deep into my chest cavity. My view distorted through a foggy tunnel-like perspective. For a moment I was confident death's grip had ensnared me. Then the brutal reality of my predicament snapped everything back into focus. As I scrambled to my feet, the creature lunged toward the hut with startling speed. Dominic! I shouted hoping he could hear me and brace himself for the impact. I dove into the hut just as the creature crashed into the structure, its guttural snarls filling the air. We were trapped in the crumbling hut, but knew that staying silent and still was our only chance at survival. The monstrous creature circled outside, searching for a way in, its twisted limbs clawing at the earth as its grotesque body scraped against the decrepit walls. The beast's matted hair was streaked with fresh blood, evidence of its deadly intentions. Huddled together in a corner, Dominic and I exchanged a silent decision to stay put. We didn't have any other choice. Panic gnawed at us as we realized how slim our chances of escape were. Despite this impending threat, either of us dared to call for help. We understood that would only draw unwanted attention from whatever nightmare had descended upon us. The creature stalked around the hut several times more before it seemed to lose interest, or at least decide it couldn't get inside and began moving away. We listened intently to its fading grunts and snarls relief beginning to wash over us as the sounds grew more distant. Perhaps it was our size of relief or a shift in weight that gave us away, but in an instant, the creature charged back towards the hut with an ear-piercing screech. Adrenaline coursed through our veins as we frantically searched for anything within reach that could be used to defend ourselves or block the entrance from this monster. But our efforts were futile, Mere moments after rushing off, the beast slammed into our makeshift barricade, 
shattering it to splinters and leaving us completely exposed. We stared into its gnarled face and blackened eyes, knowing full well that these may be our last moments. With a surge of courage, I yelled at Dominic to follow me through an opening in the back of the hut. Desperation gave us the strength to run, but we could hear the enraged creature tearing apart the hut, hot on our heels. Branches whipped against us once again as we sprinted through the woods, this time with renewed determination to survive. It felt like the darkness was closing in, a prison containing unimaginable horrors and offering no way out. In our haste, we stumbled upon an embankment leading toward a narrow creek, the only option for escape from this relentless chase. Leaping into the icy water, Dominic and I swam across as quickly as possible, never taking our eyes off the shore where the beast would inevitably follow. Our splashes and labored breaths seemed to barely mask its snarls and guttural screams of frustration. As we reached the other side and desperately looked for any sign of shelter or rescue, headlights appeared in the distance. Overwhelming relief flooded our minds as we knew they represented a chance at survival. But moreover, a way to alert others about this unspeakable terror that had been unleashed on unsuspecting campers. Dominic and I managed to flag down the approaching vehicle. It turned out to be some locals who were searching for their missing friend. When they heard our harrowing tale before finally breaking down into shock-induced sobs and struggle for coherent explanations, they didn't hesitate in grabbing their firearms presumably hunting rifles, and urging us all to get inside their truck. Although Dominic and I had narrowly escaped with our lives that night, it felt like an insurmountable weight remained on our shoulders. We knew we could never truly move past what happened. It would haunt us every time we closed our eyes or heard rustling in woods at night. Moreover, the thought of other innocent people coming face to face with this unspeakable horror was gut-wrenching, and we realized we had an obligation to make sure their stories didn't end like the hapless campers we'd discovered. I glanced back at the dark forest one last time before the truck sped away, desperate to leave that nightmare behind. I knew that our fight wasn't over yet. We had to make sure no one else would ever encounter this monstrous creature. That was something Dominic and I promised ourselves as night engulfed us. No one would ever be at its mercy again. September 2018 I found myself camping with my buddies in the remote area of the Appalachian Mountains, far away from the hustle and bustle of city life. We had decided to escape for a couple of days to enjoy the fresh air and embark on some thrilling adventures. As we gathered around our campfire one evening, we exchanged light-hearted jokes to pass the time. So why did the invisible man turn down a job offer? I asked my friends anticipating a chuckle. Give up? I continued as they shrugged. Because they just couldn't see himself doing it. We all laughed heartily, completely oblivious to the traumatic experience that awaited us. Our laughter was interrupted by distant noises, a mixture of what sounded like rustling leaves, grunts, and other strange sounds we couldn't quite identify. One of my friends attempted to assure us it was probably just a wild animal in search of food. However, his reassurance wasn't convincing enough. The mysterious noises seemed perfectly timed with each transitioning period between night and day. They were prevalent enough that they could no longer be attributed merely to coincidence or random occurrences. They appeared orchestrated and intentional. Fueled by curious suspicion, we decided to follow the dubious sounds one evening. We meandered cautiously through the thick woods, hearts pounding faster with each step, 
as the bizarre grunts led us further away from our cozy campsite. Meanwhile, clouds obscured the moon overhead casting everything in complete darkness, a perfect breeding ground for fear and paranoia. Suddenly, we caught sight of a grotesque creature in between shadows cast by tree branches. It was unlike anything we had ever seen before, standing on two legs like a human but with hideous features that could only be described as animalistic. It had matted fur all over its body and long sharp claws on its hands extending from what appeared to be elongated fingers. Before any of us could comprehend what was happening, the creature pounced on one of my friends, tearing his flesh apart like a wild animal, blood gushing profusely from the deep gashes. The helplessness we felt turned into sheer panic as we watched our friends struggle beneath the monster's fury. We could have attempted to call for help at that moment. But in our state of shock and panic, it was impossible to muster the courage or presence of mind. Moreover, we were aware that any help would be miles away and likely unable to reach us quickly enough. Survival instincts kicked in, and my remaining friends and I managed to sprint back towards our campsite, glancing back to see the gruesome aftermath unfolding in horror. All the while, the creature seemed fixated only on him, but we knew being far away from it wouldn't guarantee our safety either. As we huddled around our dying fire back at camp, all of us trembled with shock and disbelief over what had just occurred. Was that unearthly beast even real? Or was it some sort of twisted manifestation raising hell on earth? What do we do now? Another friend asked with an edge of hysteria. We can't stay here. That thing will tear us all apart. I know, I replied tears streaming down my face. But we're too far from civilization to make it out of here tonight. As my words hung heavily in the cold mountain air, distant sounds reached us again, indicating that perhaps the creature hadn't finished for the night after all. We decided that the only thing we could do was to try to last the night and hopefully find help in the morning. Though still afraid, we began fortifying our camp as best we could, using whatever we had to create barriers and improvised weapons. We knew it wasn't much, but it was all we had. As the night progressed, the sound of heavy breathing and rustling from beyond our makeshift defenses sent shivers down our spines. Every so often, a guttural growl or a snapping of branches would cause us to jump. Finally, I could take it no longer. I'm going to call for help, I whispered. My friends agreed, and I pulled out my phone, desperately attempting to make a connection. By some miracle, my call went through, and I explained our situation as concisely and logically as possible. The operator on the other end informed us that help was on its way but added that it might take some time given our remote location. We thanked them and hung up, praying that assistance would arrive in time. While waiting for help to arrive, we did our best to stay alert and defend ourselves against any possible attack by the creature. As minutes turned into hours, our exhaustion threatened to overtake us. Just when hope seemed lost, the sound of approaching vehicles and human voices reached us through the darkness. A search party had arrived. They rapidly made their way into our campsite with flashlights illuminating the surroundings. Realizing that our nightmare might finally be over now that help had come, a sense of relief washed over us. The team questioned us about the creature, where it had attacked our friend, and any other relevant details they needed. We told them everything we knew about this horrendous beast its animalistic nature, sharp claws, matted fur, in hopes that they might be able to capture or kill it before it claimed any more victims. The search party led us back to civilization, and along the way, we passed the gruesome scene of our friend's attack. It was unbearable to see, 
but it was a stark reminder of the grim reality we faced. Upon our arrival back home, we were met with warm welcomes from loved ones who had worried about us being missing for days. As grateful as we were to be safe, we couldn't forget about our friend or what had transpired in that dense forest. As days turned into weeks, our lives slowly began to return to normal. However, news came that the creature had never been found, causing fear to rise again within us. The authorities had investigated the scene of the attack and followed several leads, but ultimately concluded that it was too dangerous for them to pursue the unknown beast further. We knew that somewhere out there, lurking in the shadows between tree branches, was the grotesque creature that had violently taken our friend's life. We could only hope that it would not claim any more victims in the future. In memory of our dear friend who lost his life during that terrifying encounter, we vowed never to return to those woods again. We did our best to move forward with our lives, but deep down inside each of us, in those quiet moments when nobody else was around, we knew we'd never shake off the chilling memories of that horrific nightmare. And even though we couldn't prove it or know for certain what fate might have awaited us next, a kernel of doubt lingered at the back of our minds. Was this really the end? Or was there still a horrifying secret awaiting others who dared enter those seemingly peaceful woods? In September of 2021, I decided to take a solo camping trip in a remote area of the Appalachian Mountains. My life had been nothing short of ordinary, and as a local history teacher named Gerald O'Keefe, I needed a break from the hustle of city life. The campground I chose was called Benson's Ridge, which was described by many as an untouched paradise away from civilization. Getting there took some time, but it was worth every second of the drive. The moment I arrived at my campsite, however, a mild sense of unease washed over me. It was difficult to place, but it felt like I wasn't alone, despite being miles away from anybody else. While setting up my tent, an elderly man approached me. His name was George Fitzwilliam, and he lived in a nearby cabin. Despite his age, he possessed an unusual amount of energy for someone in his seventies. "'What brings you out here?' he inquired with a thick Appalachian accent. "'Just wanted to escape the city for a bit,' I responded. "'Huh,' George chuckled. "'Well, you're not going to find too much excitement out here.' I laughed and thanked him for stopping by. As he turned to leave, however, his laugh vanished abruptly. Just be careful around these parts, he added gravely. There have been some stories about this area. With that ominous warning hanging in the air, George disappeared into the trees. That night as I lay in my sleeping bag listening to the sounds of the forest around me, the crickets chirping and leaves rustling, I attempted to put George's warning out of my mind. Sleep finally took me as exhaustion from setting up camp overwhelmed my senses. It must have been near midnight when faint scuffling noises near my tent woke me up abruptly. Frozen in fear and remembering George's message earlier that day made it hard to ignore the noise. I remembered I had brought a small flashlight and with a shaking hand grabbed for it. I wasn't exactly sure what I expected, but just pointed it in the direction of the commotion. As the beam illuminated the ground, I caught a glimpse of something skittering away into the darkness. It was fairly large and had an unnaturally long tail with a slender body. Mixed feelings of curiosity and fear gripped me as I thought about investigating further or staying in my tent. To make matters worse, my phone had no service in this part of the mountains, 
leaving me cut off from any kind of support if necessary. My mind raced through various scenarios as the scuffling sounds grew louder and closer. Maybe it was just some native wildlife I wasn't familiar with. But then I remember George's cryptic message paired with these suspicious noises, concluding that this creature didn't seem natural at all. The noises grew louder outside at some point I doubted whether this was even an animal to begin with. Suddenly, in the distance, I could see something moving through an illuminated patch of trees. Trying to keep my breathing steady and doing my best to calm down my racing heartbeat, I trained my flashlight on what felt like an otherworldly creature. The beam finally caught what appeared to be a mix between a human and beast. My stomach churned as I took in its grotesque features, a horribly twisted face that seemed almost human-like, but not quite was accompanied by appendages that resembled limbs but were scaly with claws that gashed into trees while moving towards me. I yelled, hoping that someone at the campsite might hear me. No response. Perhaps they were too far away, or maybe they had already been attacked by this creature. The beast continued to inch closer, its claws leaving deep gashes in the forest floor. My panic grew, but I knew I needed to act fast if I wanted to survive. Without any other weapon or plan, I decided that my best chance was to run. I burst out of the tent and sprinted through the darkness, fueled by adrenaline. As I ran, I could hear the creature pursuing me, its claws scraping against the earth and trees. Through the trees ahead, I noticed a faint glow in my panic. I had dropped my flashlight. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed it and shone it behind me. The creature let out a guttural screech as it recoiled from the beam of light. It seemed that it was sensitive to light. Relief washed over me. I had found a temporary reprieve from the monster's pursuit. But I knew my luck wouldn't last long and continued running towards the campsite while keeping an eye behind me. Upon reaching George's tent, I immediately woke him up and quickly explained the situation. We need to call for help! George exclaimed as he realized how dire our situation was. Our phones were useless with no service but George remembered that he had a satellite phone in his truck parked at the entrance of the camping grounds. We gathered our supplies and moved in a tight cluster all of us holding flashlights to ward off any attack from the terrifying creature. When we reached George's truck, he quickly unlocked it and fumbled around for his satellite phone. Once he found it, George dialed the local authorities to report our situation and request urgent assistance. As we waited for help to arrive, we kept our flashlights on at all times and maintained a strict watch around the perimeter. The creature lurked in the dark, growling and hissing but unable to advance towards the lights we were holding. Finally, we heard the distant sound of sirens, signaling help was on its way. The creature seemed to recognize the threat it posed to its existence with a final roar. It retreated into the depths of the forest and disappeared from sight. The authorities arrived and questioned us about our terrifying encounter. They informed us that they had received reports of mysterious animal attacks in recent months but had been unable to determine their cause. They promised to investigate further and ensure that the creature would be dealt with so that no one else would ever suffer at its hands. As we left the campsite along with a growing sense of relief, I couldn't help but think about those who weren't fortunate enough to escape this terrible creature's grasp. Their final moments must have been filled with fear and agony. Although we survived this horrific ordeal, I knew that I would never forget the terror we experienced. In the aftermath of our harrowing encounter, a specialist team was put together by the authorities to hunt down and eliminate the dangerous creature. 
They found it hiding deep within a cave system, confirming what we had discovered. It was indeed sensitive to light and had been using darkness as its hunting grounds. After capturing and studying it, they determined that it was an undiscovered species of predator with reptilian characteristics, which they later named after our friend George in recognition of his pivotal role in their success. Life returned to normal for us eventually, but every time I found myself in darkness or ventured out into nature, I couldn't help but remember our brush with death in those dark woods. We were forever grateful that we'd managed to survive and thankful for the actions of our friend George. Without him, that nightmare could have ended very differently. <laughs>